Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I was born into a Protestant family, actually. You know, my grandfather's an orange man, but he met a woman down in Cork, and she was a Catholic. And when they got married, she demanded that their children be brought up Catholic. Otherwise, my life would be different from what it would be now, you know. I'll put your name down, I'll get you up here with me, so I was all oh, brilliant. Two days later, he was shot dead, not too far from here. Shot six times in the face and the head by loyalists, murdered, just from being a Catholic up here at the time. So with Bloody Sunday and the murder of my friend James, it was me Phoenix were here. And I decided what my brothers were trying to do all the time, make me join the Republican movement. You know, and I decided that was the only way to change things here, to join the IRA. After a few months of training and learning things, I started to change. You know, I didn't want revenge as such. But I wanted no longer to be treated like a dog in my own country, in my own city. Didn't want to be treated like a second-class citizen. And this was Ireland, yet it was occupied by Britain. Didn't think I had any right to be here. You know, I wouldn't have, well, Ireland wouldn't have a right to be in Britain, occupying England and London. So it was the same here. For me, my attitude was there shouldn't be any British here whatsoever, you know. When I got out, I got out in 1976. And about eight months later, I was captured in Belfast in a van with a load of bombs and machine guns, myself and five other comrades. But the time in the hit blocks was horrendous. I was there for eight years. I was naked. I was stripped of all my clothes. As soon as I came into reception, the day I was sent, they brought me into reception. So it's like a room like this, six or seven screws waiting for you, were buttons. And the first thing they do is they start ripping all your clothes off till you're naked, trying to humiliate you because you refuse to put on the prison uniform because you're not a criminal. I'm a political prisoner, as I told them, I'm not wearing it. So they just kept beating and beating and beating me, you know. During the hunger strikes, we shot 38 screws dead. And I thought we should have shot more. I wanted as many, up 100, 200 of them dead. Even today, I check their names and see who's died, who's died of cancer or whatever, you know. I, don't, I hate them so much. They got away, brutalizing us and torturing us for years, got away with it. They got big bounty money, and they loved doing what they did, you know? And these are war criminals. My, my, my father couldn't be broke by anybody or anything, you know? But uh, the sight of me, that's what I broke me, you know? Boom, we're on. Very good. And today's guest, we've got Sam Muller. Sam, how are you, brother? James, thank you for having me. Thanks it's for coming pleasure. on. Pleasure. No, thank you. Bit of a mad story, Sam. Involved with the IRA. Ended up in America. One of the biggest heists in American history. Sent to prison. President's phone in White House. It's a unbelievable story. And I'm glad you're here to tell the tale. No, oh, I'm still glad to be alive to tell the tale, you know. <laughs> First and foremost, Sam, how are you? Uh, pretty good, you know, but uh, yeah, my life story is a bit strange, you know, because uh, I was born into a Protestant family, actually, you know, my grandfather's an orange man, but he met a woman down in Cork, and she was a Catholic, and when they got married, she demanded that their children be brought up Catholic, otherwise my life would be different from what it would be now, you know. Yeah, I, I spoke to a few people from um, both sides of the conflict yes. here, and they say the exact same if they grew up a mile down the road they'd have been fighting for another cause exactly. it's, it's just the, the environment you grew in that's you just all it is consumes you, know? you 
I always go back to the start of my guest, Sam. Where did you grow up and how it all began? I grew up in a street called Lancaster Street, Belfast. It's quite a famous street. From the 1930s, there's always been rats. It's a small nationalist enclave surrounded by loyalists. It's been like that for since the 1900s. Quite a famous street. And uh, in 1930, the New York Times had front page because there were so many people murdered in the street by loyalists, narcissists, and Catholics. So that's a street I was brought up in. It's a very, very staunch Republican street. And really, from that street onwards, that's where I was born and brought up. My family were Republicans, although I never really had an interest. As a wee lad growing up, I was more interested in uh, discos, girls, and beer. It was all my interest. My brothers were all politically aware. They were into all the politics and republicanism. I had absolutely no interest. You know, as I said, only uh, going to disco with my friends. But when I was about 15, a couple of things changed my life. And one of them was uh, my brother brought me to Derry in 1971. I didn't know really where Derry was, but he says he were going for a trip down to Derry. I didn't care, as long as I was getting out of Belfast, that was the main thing, you know. So it was a Sunday, I'll never forget it, because it happened to be bloody Sunday. And I changed my whole life, because before it, I, I wasn't too much into politics, didn't really know what was going on here. My brothers used to hammer it into me about the inequality of being a Catholic, being a nurse, has been treated like a second-class citizen. So that practically started to change my whole outlook about this place, you know. And about two months after it, one more event happened. And that was me finished with this place, you know. Uh, my friend, Jim Kerr, 16, he had just got a job in a garage up here in the Lisburn Road, coincidentally. And I was working in the slaughterhouse, so I was quite envious, you know, and the slaughterhouse was a rough, rough place, you know. It was like 93% loyalists, 7% Catholic. It was a very dangerous place. I hated it. But he said to me, look, don't worry, give me a chance to get in. Once I get into this job, a few months, I'll put your name down, I'll get you up here with me. So I was all oh, brilliant. Two days later, he was shot dead, not too far from here. Shot six times in the face and the head by loyalists, murdered, just for being a Catholic up here at the time. So with Bloody Sunday and the murder of my friend James, it was me finished were here. And I decided what my brothers were trying to do all the time, make me join the Republican movement. You know, and I decided that was the only way to change things here, to join the IRA. And that's why you joined for... Revenge as well, and to... I guess it was. At the time, it was revenge because I wasn't too politically aware. You know, I was naive because when the IRA found out what I was really joining them for, they, they ostracized me. They sort of kept me away from anything. They weren't, because they don't want you for personal vendettas or anything like this. You have to be educated first to find out, is this what you're willing to fight for? You know, everybody thinks, oh, yeah, get you in there and the IRA will take you in. It's not like that at all, you know. They take our time to find out what type of person you are, you know, and I, as I say, was very naive to it all. And after a few months of training and learning things, I started to change. You know, I didn't want revenge as such, but I wanted no longer to be treated like a dog in my own country, in my own city. I didn't want to be treated like a second-class citizen. And this was Ireland, yet it was occupied by Britain. I didn't think I had any right to be here. You know, I wouldn't have, Ireland wouldn't have a right to be in Britain occupying England and London. So it was the same here. For me, my attitude was there shouldn't be any British here whatsoever, you know. What sort of training did you have to go through? Well, to start, it was all political. Just uh, trying to get you to see how much you know about your own history, about the real reasons behind wanting to join the ARA, you know. They don't want any maniacs, really. I don't hear what I say. It's funny, the ARA doesn't want any maniacs in the ranks, you know. But you do a lot of political stuff, and I was quite getting bored with it. I wasn't really, you know, into too much about the reading of stuff like that there. But after a while, you get taken to camps down south where you get to learn how to train with weapons and explosives and things like this. So when you go back up to the north, you'd be better prepared to fight the Brits who were there at the time, the British Army. So you're training yourself to be, to handle conflict and take away the anger side where you want revenge, where it becomes more of an organisation that, you're more in tune of what's going on and what you're fighting for. Yes, it changed me. Definitely changed me. I met men, and you know, I was only a kid really, but I started to meet men who had been doing this a long time in their life. You know, before in the fifties and sixties and all, they were hardened sort of veterans and on. It changed me listening to them because I was a bit of an idiot. Like I was just a nutcase, you know. 
But once I started to talk to these men, they were showing me the bigger picture. It's nothing to do with Protestants and Catholics. That's sectarian. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Because as far as we were concerned, we were going to fight for them as well. This is our country as well. But they had to treat people equal. We had had to treat them equal. And that's the way, I want, that's the way we wanted it. And that's where I learned the training. Does that hurt you? Like, Irish men killing Irish men? Like, does, that, does it sting, really, when you think about countrymen killing their own... Like, it's, it's, from it, living from the outside, it is mad when you look in. Like, just a few miles across the water we've got Scotland but then there's a, a kind of war zone going on where people are killing each other yeah. bombing each other innocent people innocent lives getting took that it is mad to think that this was only a few years ago a yes. few years ago like does that come in your mind that these are your same people or is it just they're fighting for a cause and you're fighting for a cause well as I said different events changed my whole life and I wasn't going to no longer be treated like a second class citizen here in my own country you know and at the, mean, at the back of my head also was, if we ever did get the country united, unionists would have to be treated equally too. We had to learn from their mistakes, the way they treated us, you know. And people from outside think about, oh, it's a Catholic-Protestant conflict. It's a, lot, it's a lot of nonsense, actually, you know. But that's how it's been given by the media. The media is a great manipulator of propaganda. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I was born a Catholic, but... Never practiced, never went. Didn't bar me why you're Protestant, Catholic, and atheist, Muslim. I couldn't care less about religion. It's got nothing to do with it. But when you're coming into my street to murder my neighbors and to murder my family, I'm not going to stand idly by, you know. That's what the whole concept was for me at the start, you know. It was the only way to get back at these armored cars, British, British Army coming into the streets, murdering people in Derry and getting away with it. They murdered 14 people, the paratroopers. Got medals from Lizzie Windsor for doing it, you know. And for me, I was the only way to change things was to use force against force. And I was terrified. I didn't like it. You know, I always crap myself going to be killed. I wanted to go back to disco days. That was never going to happen again unless I changed things. But I missed them. And now I was on a course now where force was the only thing that I knew because it was force being used against me by loyalists and by the British. How was that seeing like friends die, kids die? Like, how was that mentally for a man to see that? Well, I can still remember my friend Jim, you know, talking to him at night, we're talking football, and the next morning he's dead, you know. Still remember a few of my friends and their friends. I've seen a lot of scenes, terrible scenes, you know. I've seen arms and legs landing on the streets after bombings and things like this. There was a very famous, infamous bombing called McGurk's Bar, where all these civilian Catholics were murdered. Bombs, two bombs put in the bar, and then the British media said that the people inside who were killed were making bombs. So there was poor, innocent people. Damned again, condemned again. Once they were blew up, and then their names were dragged through the gutter. It's only lately, 40 years later, that the British have apologised for spreading them rumours and using the newspapers, you know? There's a lot of people looking from the outside think it's a Catholic Protestant yeah. thing. It goes a lot deeper. Like, can yeah. you explain to people what what is the main issues and why it all started? Well, basically, in a nutshell, before trying to make it too complex, is this is part of Ireland. This is the northern part of Ireland. It's nothing to do with Britain. Britain has occupied us for 800 years using force because we're a small country, you know. Britain's a very powerful country. They, they invaded so many countries around the world. Their history stained with invading countries, you know. And for me, no country has a right to be in anybody's country. That's up to the people who live there to determine their own futures. And I don't care how many in our country is, they have no right to be here. America shouldn't have been in Vietnam, etc., etc. It's the same argument. Britain has no right to be in Ireland. And unfortunately, the Britain had the British had the unionists here and give them all different rights, had give them in charge of everything. They had all like nice houses, a good property, good jobs, best education, where Catholics were treated like gutter. And that had to change, you know. You get sent to prison as well? Well, when I was uh sixteen, I got sent to Long Cash. And I was done under what's called the Diplock Court. It was just that they just created this. The British created this. It's a non-jury trial, so-called trial, and a British judge is there to convict you. Now, I was only 16, and he said I was in the ARA. There was no evidence to say I was in the ARA. And most people were getting fined £30. That's how much the loyalists, they were getting fined £15 because they were in the UVF, UDA. And the next thing he hands me three years. Now I'm only a wee lot of 16 years of age, you know. Never seen a prison, never understood it. And when he sent me to Long Cash, inside that was a political prison, it's a big camp. 
full of political prisoners. I started to get educated by these guys, teachers, professors who were in there, learn more about what I was fighting for and how to fight better. So when I got out three years later, you know, I really, really started to fight the British earnestly, you know, and I really hurt them in lots of ways. What was it like being in Long Cash? Was that where they'd done the hunger strikes and stuff? No, that's the second time I came back. This was nearly 70s, and it was a big political camp. There was no screws allowed inside the cages, and you, you trained, and you exercised, you did a lot of gymnastics and all this, and your education, you, that's all you did, train and education, train and education, you know, until you got out. Now, when I got out, I got out in 1976, and about eight months later, I was captured in Belfast in a van with a load of bombs and machine guns, myself and five other comrades. But when we were stopped by a British foot patrol, we jumped out of the van, there was a lot of fisty cups. We started fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, and we got away, everybody got away. So I was wanted for a long, long time until I was caught, about three months later, I was caught doing an operation. And at this time, Margaret Thatcher had taken away political status from all the prisoners who were fighting against Britain. They tried to make it into a criminal enterprise that if you fought Britain, you were a criminal. You know, as Karl Marx used to say, you know, if, if you're English, you fight the Irish, you're a hero. But if you're Irish, you fight the English, you're an outlaw. And that's the way it was. She tried to make us outlaws and be criminals, but we weren't going to have it. So when I went into Common Road Jail, the status was taken off and I was sentenced to 10 years this time for having explosives and machine guns. And they put me in what was developed, just built by Margaret Thatcher, these new things called the hate blocks. Quite frightening. They were actually designed from the Nazis to put the Jews away during the concentration camps. This was the next phase that they had. They had these things ready, these hate blocks, and that was the same design. And she always boasted that these are, you can never get out. You, they're escape proof. Of course, years later, we proved that wrong when we had the greatest escape ever in Europe, European history where 38 men escaped, you know. But the time in the hate blocks was horrendous. I was there for eight years. I was naked. I was stripped of all my clothes. As soon as I came into the reception, the day I was sent, they brought me into the reception. So it's like a room like this, six or seven screws waiting for you, wear buttons. And the first thing they do is they start ripping all your clothes off till you're naked, trying to humiliate you because you refuse to put on the prison uniform because you're not a criminal. I'm a political prisoner, as I told them, I'm not wearing it. So they just kept beating and beating and beating me, you know. And it was quite horrendous. And then I remember getting dragged by the ankles up a good uh, 20, 30 feet through tarmac. And the tarmac was ripping my shred. I'm completely naked at this time, you know. And so when you get up back into the blocks, you're only reaching the blocks now. You've got more screws waiting for you. You've got the governor waiting for you. And because you refuse to say, sir, he also says you call him sir. I never called anybody sir in my life. My father says you call no man sir. And I tell you, because I refused, I got an hour beaten. And by the time I got into the cell, that tiny, tiny cell, the blood was pouring out of me. And that was my start to hit blocks for eight years. Naked. Does that fuel you with more fire? It does. With hatred and rage and... Not hatred. I would call it, I seek justice. During the, during the hunger strikes, we shot 38 screws dead. And I thought we should have shot more. I wanted as many, up 100, 200 of them dead. Even today, I check their names and see who's died, who's died of cancer or whatever. You know, I don't. I hate them so much. They got away, brutalizing us and torturing us for years, got away with it. They got big bounty money and they loved doing what they did, you know, and these are war criminals. How do you survive then without either being killed or killing someone in there? In Long Cash? Yeah. Well, there were screws killed in Long Cash. I'm not getting into that, you know. Mm -hmm. But we killed a total of 38 prison guards, as they're called. I call them screws, you know. They were involved in the torture of political prisoners, naked political prisoners, you know. There was a lot more shit there, like, not shit there, but shit and survived. But for me, that wasn't enough. Some people said, well, it's a big number, 38, you know. But I wanted to be hundreds of them killed. You know, and today I still hate them because they got away with it. Don't hate British soldiers. They were doing their duty. That's what they were over here doing. I mean, agree with what they're doing, British soldiers, but they're over here doing their duty. They had no option, especially a lot of them come from working class areas, you know, especially in Glasgow or somewhere like this here, somewhere in London, poor areas in London. But these were guys who deliberately went and took this job as a guard, the guard 
political prisoners naked and to torture them. Torture me every day. I'm getting beat up every day, you know. You're naked and you're talking about four or five screws coming into your cell. That's what you had to been on for years. How can you forgive? You know, think about it. Yeah, that's rough. Think about it. Mm-hmm. You know? And was this, how many prisoners was this happening to? Well, it was 300 of us. I fancy at the start, there was only like 10 of us. I was one of the early blanket men. They were called the blanket men at the time in the H blocks. What does that mean? Because uh, all they give us was this tiny blanket, very coarse. It's like a billow pad. When you put it on, it it was only like a tiny thing to put around. You were naked except that there, and you know, it was supposed to cover your dignity. But it was a joke, like, and it was more to torture you more because you couldn't do anything. You couldn't sleep because it cut right into your skin and all. So we got the nickname from people I'd say called the Blanket Man. And that was a, was a very famous Blanket Man. When you're a Blanket Man, you're very famous. People have an awful lot of respect for you, especially in the north of Ireland, you know. What yeah. about food? Food? Yeah. Well, the food was basic prison food, but you were getting all sorts of strange things on it. You can imagine, you know, these guys are feeding you as food, and you know what they're doing, you know yourself. I don't want to start talking about what they were doing to the food, you know. But it's, I lost half my body weight. My father didn't recognize me eight years. I remember going out the gate after I'd done my time. And I remember my father waiting at the gate for me and he, and he was still staring past me. He didn't, I hadn't seen him for eight years and he didn't know who I was. And my hair was way down my back. I was as skinny as that. You know, before that I used to do weights and everything like this here. And he hadn't a clue who I was. And he just started crying. Never seen him crying. Only seen him crying twice. It was once a bloody Sunday when he thought I was dead. And that time when I got out of long case, and he was, it, it, it changed him. It broke him more than it broke me. Yeah, seen my father son. never got away because he thought my son was going through this. Well, you know, why did I lose? But there's nothing he could do, you know. But that's the way my father was thinking, you know, mm-hmm. as he should have been doing things. He had wanted to go out and kill the screws if he thought he knew what was going on, you know. But it broke him. Were you allowed letters? Send anything out? No visitors? What was it? I never got a visit. I never got a visit ever. And I haven't seen my family from the day I went in until I got out about eight and a half year, years later, roughly. I never seen any of my family. Never had contact with them. Occasionally, you may get a letter, but most of the time, the screws would burn them or rip them up, you know, and send you an envelope and laugh. Say, oh, it was a letter if you, but you're not getting it, you know. It's this sort of nonsense, you know. So I had very little communications with my family at the time. There was one particular incident that always stuck out in my head when I was about eight. My mother walked out on us. When we were kids, and never, I never seen her again. I was eight years of age. I just walked out the door one day, never came back again. So I'd forgotten all about her. And I remember this priest coming down the corridor in the blacks. And I'll never forget it, because any time you seen these priests, the only time they ever showed their fucking faces was when they were coming in to say somebody had died. You know, they wouldn't do anything for you. Weren't they calling themselves priests and Christians, but they never did anything, you know, for you. So everybody's seen, we called them the angel of death. Because any time we're coming in, it's just to tell you somebody died and you always knew it was bad news. I just think, oh shit, some poor bastard's going to get some bad news here, you know? And then next thing I hear him stopping outside my door, the cell door in the rut and the keys and the screws are screaming, get back, mother, get back. You no, know, because I stand at the door, you know? And the next thing a priest shows up, looks at me. I thought, oh God, my father's dead, you know? That's the only thing I could think of, you know? And he turns and he says, um, sorry to have to tell you, but your mother's dead. I, I hadn't a clue what he's talking about. I said, my mother? What are you talking about? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was found dead down in Dublin. And it took me about a couple of years later to try and get into my head that my mother was still alive at this time. I thought she died the day she walked out the door, you know, when I was eight. And here's this priest telling me now, she's only dead now, you know. It made me quite angry at my mother being alive. She never tried to contact us, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So those kind of things, you had all that, plus the beatings and all sorts of psychological things. And it was just... Terrible, terrible things. I mean, you know, during the winter, I took out all the windows and you'd be freezing. And the, the piss, because you were, you, were, you were living in piss and shit because you weren't out of your cell. And we had to use the walls covered in shit. We were covered in shit. And when you pissed, the, the ice cold from the night was freezing the whole floors. It was just like an ice rink. And they, your skin used to stick to it, you know, because it was that freaking cold. I'll never forget the cold. And I used to think, God, kill me, stop torturing me, kill me now, get this over with, you know, how far can I go? Because you were just getting tortured different ways every day, you know? How I didn't go insane was, it's unbelievable, like, you know? Because you so could easily so just want to slip your mind, you know, you would have went completely crazy. 
Did anybody ever kill themselves or wake up dead with the cold? Or no, starvation? nobody ever did. Nobody afterwards. Yeah, after afterwards when they got out, they couldn't handle men killed themselves, committed suicide. You know, like prisoners and all, they just couldn't cope with the seeing things the way the world had changed. You know, and they hadn't seen their wives and kids in so long a time, so many years and all. Everything had changed. They couldn't cope. You know, plus the torture went on in their heads. What they got, like, I guess, like me, most of them never forget it. You know, we don't talk about it. Nobody talks about it. it's a problem. You know. Especially in Belfast, we, everybody regards you as a, a tough guy, a hard man. You shouldn't be talking about things like that. It's only for sissies and softies, you know, nonsense, you know. But that's how it was at the time. When did the hunger strike start? Was it 1981? Yes, that's when the, we had one hunger strike and it collapsed. The Brits agreed to give us our demands of uh, stop treating us like criminals and give us our clothes back, etc., etc., you know. But once the hunger strike ended, they were egg. Margaret Thatcher reneged on it, you know. It caused a lot of problems. So a second hunger strike started, led by Bobby Sands, nine other men. And this one was going to be different because we knew that there's no doubt whatsoever Bobby and the other lads were going to die. We knew Margaret Thatcher was going to let them die because Uri Neve had been killed. Her personal friend, he'd been blown up by the ANLA and she had this terrible personal grudge against Republicans, you know, get for, for personal revenge, you know. If Margaret Thatcher hadn't have been in charge, the, the hunger, there would never have been a hunger strike. It was through horror that men died. Hard determination to get revenge for her and Eve, you know. Yeah, she was an evil bastard. She man. was a very, uh, very evil woman. She got to Scotland as oh, well, man. Horrible. Of course, un incredible what she got away with, like, you know, mm. and uh, no, no comparison, no comparison and no sorrow for what she did, like, you know. She was a war criminal, but, you know, unfortunately she died in bed. So she agreed with the first hunger strike and everything was back she to normal. She agreed, yes, signed it, got the first, uh, that their bonds were basic, they weren't big. The man's wear our army clothes, not convict uniform, have a visit once a week, have a food parcel. That was a basic things, you know, didn't want any big, big things. And so it was a fancy agree too, you know, because they were a wee bit scared because they seen support outside growing, you know. But once the, the man came off, two weeks later, she reneged and she wasn't going to give us anything. And the problem with it was we had started such a mo momentum with support outside, people were expecting the hunger strike and they were supporting and supporting and all of a sudden the hunger strike's over and I think we got what we got. So it's hard to get people into their heads saying, look, we didn't get nothing. We're still lying here naked. So it took a long month, two months to get word back out to people. We got nothing. We're still lying here naked. We're still getting beat up by the prison guards every day. We're still being tortured. So when the second hunger strike, it took a long time to generate support. Whenever it started, the support was unbelievable because the second hunger strike put Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin never had a lot of support, but now they are the strongest party here in Ireland, north and south. They're going into Parliament up here and they're going into Parliament down there. They are the richest party because of Irish Americans donating to them. And it was all because of the hunger strike and the blanket men. So when Bobby Sands died 66 days later, his funeral was over 100,000 people. Like. Over 120,000 people. People from all around the world. Ambassadors from different countries came to it. It was the biggest funeral of all time. And what he, but his death has generated generations of young people who, who never knew Bobby Sands, but now know about him. And now through them, they have become Republicans through the Gaelic language, things that they would not have done. So his death has really erupted for Irish freedom. I mean, when he died, he, it was a victory for Republicans, really, you know, because what he died, his memory has generated such many generations. People around the world, you go down anywhere in the world and know Bobby Sands, like Che Guevara, the name's mentioned, and the same here in Belfast in the north of Ireland, Bobby Sands, the rest of the lives that died in hunger strike. They destroyed Margaret Thatcher. It was them that broke the back of the British government, you know, and their legacy lives on today. I've had people on who was fighting for the others other side and they've says they've got nothing but respect for Bobby Sands because they says that they don't think they can have even done that went to hunger strength willing to give up their life for protest for their, their rights and it's unbelievable yeah. to give up your life for See, that here's the thing loyalist prisoners never went on the blanket a lot of them and I talked to them through because I've loyalist friends just in my family my family split down the middle because my grandfather was an orange man so I have orange relatives and you know when we talk about these things but their incentive is not the same as me. They have all the privileges. They had the good jobs. They, look, they regard themselves as British. They had the best of everything. So they don't fight the system because they, they believe the system's good. 
I'm a Catholic, a narcissist, I have nothing. So I look upon it differently. I'm here to destroy the system that's destroyed me, that's going to destroy my family. You know, we have a different incentive. Plus, they, would, they went on hunger strikes, but they weren't, they were a mock, they were like hunger strikes for five days. They knew they weren't going to die, like after a week of eating food and all, like, you know. They never, they didn't have that same incentive that Republicans have, you know, loyalists. Now, don't get me wrong, I have more in common with a working class loyalist than I do a middle class Catholic. Why is that? Because we're both working class. They don't understand it, that they have been used also by the system. They think that they're living above it. They're not, they're the same as me. They're being used. They're getting their bills now and have no money to pay in their bills and they still believe in their queen and all and their queen's laughing at them, you know? And people say middle class, they never help the working class. The, work, the, the Catholic working class never help them, turn their backs on them. In fact, they would do more damage to you than a loyalist working class guy would, you know? I would trust a loyalist any day of the week working class than a middle class Catholic. That's mad. You no, know, but that's, they, they regard themselves as different because they lived in all their nice neighborhoods, had good jobs because mm. they got a middle class education, had plenty of money. They did not like working class fighting. They used to turn their backs away and say, what are they fighting for? They should just live away they're living in the ghettos, living like shit. You know, we've got our nice wee cozy houses and our nice cozy lifestyle. We go holidays twice a year. And those days, like, there was no holiday. I mean, a holiday was like, what's a holiday, you know? But these were doing that. That was regular for them, middle-class Catholics. I've not got but contempt for, for middle-class Catholics and the Catholic Church. I detest the Catholic Church. I love to see them all closed down. Uh, so, see, when Bobby Sands died, what, what were you thinking then? Did you think change was going to come, or did you just think that was just, there was going to be more fuel to the fire? I thought Bobby died, you know, he, he became elected to Parliament. He, he, it, he demanded and commanded such unbelievable things. Like, imagine being elected to Westminster and Margaret Thatcher letting you die, one of her own MPs, you know? Plus the support that he had around the world was just unbelievable. Americans were giving us millions of dollars. When I say us, I mean the Republican movement, sending guns, machine guns that they never had before once Bobby Sands died. The support we had around the world, people started to recognize us as freedom fighters, not terrorists, as the British government tried to come across. They spent billions trying to put the propaganda that Irish Republicans were terrorists and it cost them a lot of money and all of a sudden it was destroyed by Bobby Sands. People around the world started to look at it different and say, these guys aren't terrorists, far from it. And that's when the world started to support us and it's changed forever. So see, when, when you got 10 years, was there a release date at the end or did you just get a chap at the door and say, look, you're free today? Did you know you were getting out? Well, here's what happened. It's very, very strange. There was a big escape. 30 prisoners escaped. Now, I had already done eight years, so I'm saying to myself, look, I've two more years to do. But I remained on the blanket protest. Six of us remained, even though, even though the ARA command told us to come off the protest. We refused, six of us refused. But the OC came down to us and said, without your help, we can't get these men out. We've got all these men doing life and we've got a chance of getting these men out. And this is an impregnable prison. You've got 30 gates to get out through. Each gate is like a nightmare. And I swore away and said, I was laughing. I said, are you crazy? Do you really believe this is going to happen? It's not going to happen. It's impossible to escape into this place, you know? But once they escaped, it changed everything, you know? So you didn't want to escape because you were knew you were I had no, out. if I was doing life, I would have escaped with them. Because I had only like a year and a half left, there was no point, you know, what's the point of going on the run? It's not worth it. And then what happened was they closed the whole place down. And about six months later, the governor comes to me and says, Muller, your time's up, even though I had still a year left, you know? I don't know why they were just glad to get rid of me to get me out or whatever. And he came and I was a bit shocked because I, you know, getting out and then all of a sudden it was a daunting, my head was like getting out. What am I going to, you know, my heart started going overboard. Getting out to what? I don't know what I'm going out to. I don't know what my family's are, what's going to happen to me. It was, so, was nerve wracking. It was more nerve wracking the thought about getting out of freedom than it was remaining in my cell. It was a horrible thought of walking the last yard towards freedom. That's crazy. Is that because you were so used to being in a, 
like a torture camp exactly. where you didn't know the, exactly. were you thinking every day you didn't know if exactly. your whole family and friends you were murdered don't know what's going out there what's happened what's changed who died did you ever get any news what was going on from time to time you would, you would get it from maybe a prisoner who was non-political but becoming clean the ward and they'd say oh Sam I heard you're already done this or something they told coming to tell you if he ever sees you we think like that but you never you know your world was not no longer you didn't care about your family anymore you were worried about you surviving this place as hell because I was thinking am I dead this is for all the sins that I'd done because I'm getting this every day. There's it's, there's no let up. It's not like once a week. You're getting it day after day after day. It's just coming down on you, bombarding you, you know, beatings and beatings and beatings, you know, and all kinds of torture, you know, using the weather, the heat, the cold. And it just went on. That's all I could think of. I could never think about it outside. never thought about my family because I was thinking about me surviving. How to survive? Don't be thinking about it outside. That's only going to torture you. You know, and see the day I knew I was going, it was unbelievable. It's like walking a tape rope. I was so, I thought I was going to throw up, you know. And then when I seen my father, you know, I knew it was him because he's a big, big man, you know, and my brothers. But when he just kept staring, because there were about 10 of us getting out, you know, and he kept looking, you know, to see if he could see me. Yeah, uh, it was just sad, you know. Yeah. But it broke him. My, my, my father couldn't be broke by anybody or anything, you know, but uh, the sight of me, that sort of way broken, you know. Sorry for, you know. Okay, does that bring back a lot of emotions? Yeah, I don't, like, I don't like thinking about it, to be honest with you. To come through those gates and having every day whether or not your dad is alive or not, worrying about his son. Yeah. But, but I don't think I mean, people... When you think of it, imagine your son was inside yeah. and then all of a sudden you find out he was being tortured every day. You would what? What would you think about yourself? You would you think of let him down? You know what I mean? And I've got my, my son. If I thought I would never allow my son to go to jail, and I would never allow him to be in there, right? You know, I've done enough. None of my family's going to do it. I would never. My kids all went to university. They've all got great jobs, you know. And I would never allow them to go through what I went through. And I don't know how my father allowed me, you know. Not that he could have stopped me because I was quite headstrong. I don't know. I just would break my heart if I thought my son was arrested for a week. For anything, it would break my heart to think that he was in there. There's nothing I can do to help him. You know? I think your dad blames himself as well because oh, the way time. it ended up, and that plays a, a massive time. burden on your heart. Big time. My father hardly drank. He drank like at the weekends. You know, he worked all his life. The Saturday night, to have a few beers. Became an alcoholic. You know, and you know, you don't blame. I can't blame my, myself. I know it because I, you know, but I know it's because he thought he let me down. You know, that's the reason why. You know. So when you get out, what's in your mind then to to automatically get back involved and yeah. fight again? Or are you thinking, I'm going to get out and move away? No, I was autom I went back to active service. I wanted to deal such a hard blow against the British that they didn't know what hit them. I wanted to do so much damage to them, you know. It was all building up to me and I wanted to do the same to screws, you know. And then the strangest thing ever, strange, it, was, it was like a strange change in my whole life. I was only out about two days. I didn't know my father had this plan in the back of his head. You know, he had this plot going and he introduced me to this young girl because my father used to be in charge of the Republican clubs. You know, he'd be watching all the security and all and he called me over one day. And I didn't really talk to my father much because I'd changed so much. I didn't like talking to people. I didn't like to be with people, you know. It was very, I find it very hard to communicate. And he says, listen, son, can you just stay here for a couple of minutes? I need to go and talk with somebody. So I stood outside the big Republican club I have in the New Lodge where I was born, you know. And I wasn't even going in, but I wasn't even drinking. The next thing, this young girl comes out and she says, you want to talk to me? She says to me, I look at her, I says, no, I, you've got the wrong person. You know, I'm, I'm just covering for my, my dad, you know. And she says, yeah, it was your dad that sent me out. Little did I know, he had been plotting for a year for this girl and me to meet up because he believed this girl would take, take me away from the area, you know. If I fell in love with her, and I fell in love with her, you know, and I started to go shift myself from Republican movement, you know, people say, oh, when you're in there, you're in there for, area for life. It's a lot of nonsense. You leave any time you want. But I never, there's no way, if you said to me, you're going to leave ARA, I'd, I'd looked at you as if you're crazy. It was my life, ARA was my life. But all of a sudden, my whole, I'm changing. I'm, I'm looking at this girl and I'm, I'm starting to fall in love and I'm thinking, where the hell did this come from, you know? You know, why, why, why have I got these feelings again for a human being? You know, I thought they were all dead, 
in the hate relaxed. Next thing I started going away slowly, pushing from the area and being more before, holding hands, going to the park, going to the pictures, something I'd missed all my life of love. You know, and I just didn't realise at the time, you know, it saved me. And then another thing happens, next thing my mate who's in New York, working in casinos, they send me an envelope. I couldn't believe it. I opened it up. Ten one hundred dollar bills. Almost fainted. Never had never had ten P in my life. And all of a sudden I'm looking at a thousand dollars. Says, Sam, get you and Bernie over here to New York. There's a job waiting for you in the casinos. Get away from Belfast. You've done enough. You know? That's what I did. How were you treated back with the Republican Army after you'd done that sentence? Were you treated like a Yes, you're like treated a, like... A king, basically. Yeah, well, not, a, not, a, not a king. I know what you're saying. You were treated differently because people knew what you endured. Mm -hmm. There was people who couldn't... There was a lot of people came off of protests. We called them squeaky booters. They left their friends behind. And every time they came off it, the screws thought they were winning. I says, God, we're winning. These guys are coming off it. And I beat you more. I beat you more. So you start to resent your comrades who left, you know? And for a long, long time, I hated them more than I hated the screws, you know? It's only over the last few years, I've started to reconcile myself with these guys had legitimate reasons. Sometimes their parents died, their wife died, or whatever reason. At the time, I used to laugh, yeah, we've all got reasons. We've all got reasons. I've got reasons. I could come off a protest tomorrow. You don't hear me crying, you know? And then when they would leave, you knew you were in for a good beating that night, you know, because the screws thought, yeah, these guys are going to come off. They're getting a bounty. They're getting bonuses from the British government. Everyone you can put off. You know, they were getting wages beyond their belief, the money they were making, the money they were making. There's screws coming from England, screws coming from Dublin. The money was incredible what they were making, you know. They're making six and seven times their normal wage. And all they had to do is beat the shit out of these guys and get them to come off this protest, you know. It's like the Nazis. The mm -hmm. Nazis did the same to the Jews, you know. Yeah, that's some sort of torture. A lot of people... Even in Scotland, you've got Catholics and Protestants and people fight over that. But when you actually go in depth to actually what it's all about and what fueled people to want to fight and stand up and yeah. it goes a lot deeper than what people think. I always thought if you left IRA as well, that that was you, you were blackballed, you were put no. to the side, possibly dead. Is that just a lot of shit then? When the scene when the scene that I was you know, I never left because I was a scared. You know, I, I was a good operator. You know, I'm not saying I was all look at me, everybody, but I was never afraid. You know, once I had the training behind me, and I always thought one day I'm going to be dead. I always thought I was going to be dead before I was 30, you know. That's the way I had in the back of my head, you know. I was resenting the fact. But once I came out, and people knew I wasn't going to go back as a militant in the IRA, they were trying to encourage me to go into Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, but I had no respect for politicians. I still don't. I hate them. I think they're treacherous, you know. Why is that? Because they're liars. I don't care who they call themselves, whether it's Sinn Féin, DUP, the Conservatives, the Labour Party. I think they're all ours, you know, at the end of the day. They promise you everything, you know, until they get into power and then they change. Because we've had Sinn Féin, uh, they're in power, and they become worse than the Brits. It's like Animal Farm. And I'm one of their biggest critics, and they hate me because I'm a well-known writer, and, I, and they can't silence me. So they're, they're quite fearful of what I'm going to write. I write lots of critique up against them, you know. And I always said to everybody and young boys that come to me, I said, go and read Animal Farm, George Orwell. When I say, Sam said, I would join the IRA or whatever. I said, go and read Animal Farm. And see, after you read Animal Farm, you realize that's going to happen to you. You know, the pigs are just going to take over, be new masters. It's all going to be the same, but, you know. So see, when you start looking at it that way, does that make you question everything you've done, ever done then? Because you know George Orwell, 1984, is, he wrote as well. That yeah, of course. Some powerful books to open up the mind yeah. and start questioning everything. For me personally, I question everything. Um, right and wrong. What you're saying might be right, might be wrong, including yeah. myself. That, that's why you've got to question everything and understand that everybody's been growing up in different areas, different religions, different beliefs, different skills from the working class, the middle class. Like everybody is raised differently and everybody sees the world differently. See, when you start educating yourself a bit more yes. and start looking back at it all, you, do you yeah. ever think that, what the fuck was it all about? Yeah. For me, my goal is always to see my country free of Britain. That's my goal. And while Britain's here, I'll use any means. Right? I'm no longer involved in the area or anything. Now I'm a writer now, so it's, I've given up the sword and I have the pen. And for the first time, when I started writing books, I realized, you know something? The pen really is made here than the sword. I used to laugh when people said that. 
because I'd have communists and socialists saying to me, you know, one day you're going to find out that the pen is made in their sword because then I used guns and all. That was my sword. And I used to laugh at them. I used to call them cards. I said, you use it as an excuse because you are too afraid to fight. You just won't fight the British Army. You are afraid to fight, you know. You're making all these cliches and quotes and all. But as I became a writer and respect I started to generate throughout France and Italy, you know, people in the newspapers, major newspapers, I was doing interviews. I, I sat back and I realized, you know, something. <laughs> I'm getting interviews where I never got interviews as an ARA man. Now doors opening to me everywhere. I sat down with Charles de Gaulle's nephew not too long ago, you know, after he read my book on the pranks. And I'm sitting, is this crazy? <laughs> you know, 20 years ago, I'm sitting naked, getting the shit kicked into me by screws. So that's the exclusion. And here I am sitting in Paris with Charles de Gaulle's nephew, you know. What, what can you say? Life is, is a you fucking know? mad, mad journey. Yeah, like, I always crazy, say this, but... You know? When you, you don't know what that, tomorrow's going to bring. Yeah, when you're believing and you're sitting in a cell, you're thinking you're going to die for a cause, and then yep. before you know it, you're travelling the world, you're a, yep. a successful author, written best-selling books. Like, it's, it is mad. So when you got the thousand dollars to go to New York, was it an automatic deci decision to go, okay, I'm going to change my life, or no. was it hard to leave the cause? Well, I remember talking to my father, and he, you know, the thousand dollars to get me in burnout was my future wife, the girl that I met, my father introduced and to get her ticket and get me a ticket. But I had a big problem was I wasn't getting into America legally. So I knew it was going to have to be smuggled by Irish Americans. Bernie could get in. She had never been in trouble in her life. And she got in no problem. But here's the thing. I thought to myself, there's no way I'm leaving Belfast. You know, there's no way. To, I lost too many comrades. You know, I lost about 50 friends, personal friends killed during the conflict, fighting the British, fighting the loyalists. And that sits in the back of your head, you know, you keep thinking about them, you're thinking about them, you know. But I remember talking to this woman, and I was talking to her, I was saying about the conflict I had in my head, you know, I was saying, look, I feel guilty, you know. And she looked at me and says, you feel guilty? Why would you feel guilty? You of all people, you know, what you went through, do you not think you deserve an, a life now? Do you not think you've done enough, you know? And I was after talking to her, because her son, two sons had been killed, you know, and once she started to tell me, and I felt better, because I thought if this woman says, no, how could you think of even leaving Belfast, you know, your comrades have died, but she didn't. She said the opposite. She says, you not think you deserve a life now, after all you went through? And that was it. I had said to my father, Dad, it was a Friday, I'll never forget it. I said, Dad, I'll be back next Thursday. I'm going for six days to New York. And I stayed 14 years. I couldn't believe it. The first time I ever knew what freedom was, was when I walked into New York and I thought, what is this? What's this sensation? Something's doing something to my head and my hair. And I realized it was freedom. It was the first time ever I had freedom in my life and I loved it. Yeah, was that a good feeling then? Coming, did, <sighs> did you decide then you were never going to come back? I said, finished, I will never go back. Because I'd never tasted this thing as freedom. I was like a little kid giggling and people were looking at me and like, what the hell's wrong with him? He's just drunk, he's drunk, you know, and you're, it's not, you're just saying, Fuck, I never had this. And then for a while you're thinking, all my friends never had this. They still don't fucking have it. And here I am in New York, fucking free of them. I couldn't get it over me. I was like being on a high. I don't take drugs, but imagine that's what it would fucking do to you. You're just like, Whew, can't believe this. What this sensation is. And like really, after, afterwards later I'm sitting back, it's freedom. And does that, I was, that's what I was going to ask, look. Does that make you think about the friends you've lost? Listen, life's lost on both sides, but does that make you question that people never got to ever taste that? Like yes. Never taste the fact that they didn't have to be in the war zone where you're fighting each other and and then when you taste that, you're thinking, that's another burden that comes on your heart because you seem to me, you carry, you, you carry a lot of pain, brother, but it's totally understandable everything you went through. But when you're walking there and you're thinking, wow, like you don't have to look around your shoulder. I'd imagine you still would have anyway because obviously PTSD and all the trauma you've been yeah. through. But when you're walking there and you're thinking, fuck, man, like if only people could see what it was like when they took their self out there of was. that bubble. And when I was there, I tried to organise as many people as I could, ex-comrades who had been through jail, get them over with me. I was trying to explain to them, you just aren't going to fucking believe it until you come over here. You just don't know what it's like. The experience, and I thought, what are you talking about? And I said, when you come over, and we organized about six or seven people trying to get ex-prisoners to come over, give them jobs in a casino, you know? This was a way to relieve my guilt, 
you know, I still had guilt, the fact I left Belfast, you know, and the war was still going on at this time and I was still losing friends, you know, things like this here. But you go to bed at night and you're saying, you know, this is the best thing. Now my wife's pregnant and she's going to have a chain. I thought, imagine you were going to have a chain, you know, when you're in the hate blacks, you think you're going to die. Now you're in New York and your wife's going to have a baby born in New York. I thought, how hard did my life change? Was I in hell? And something got kicked up into heaven, you know? What made this all change so dramatically and so beautiful and so powerful? Unbelievable. See, if you never met your wife, though, do you think you'd have probably died here? I would never have left and I'd been dead. I'd have died in Belfast, fighting. Simple as that. She changed me. And sometimes I laugh and point to you, you made me get out of here, you know? She <laughs> like laughs like, you know what I mean? Like, she knows where I'm coming from, you know? How many close calls were you too deaf? You Obviously in the H block, but outside, bombs, outside guns. I've only a couple. I wasn't reckless. I was always very shrewd about what I was doing, you know. But afterwards, I talked to a couple of loyalists, you know, years later. Because I'm I'm, I'm I've got a lot of loyalist friends now, you know, they're playwrights, and, you know, I'm playwright and all this, and we get the talk, you know, says, so I'm, you'd be surprised how many times we went looking for you. You know, you just weren't there those nights we were told. Did you be there? The cops were telling them I was there, you know? So you're sitting in your mind, go fuck, you know, thinking of these guys getting you, taking you away somewhere, like a shank of butchers and cutting you all up and all like, you know, your your mind does terrible things to you. But I know somebody was looking after me. You know, I I don't know who it was or whatever, but somebody up there, if there was an up there, was looking down on me. Because I, I I had a charmed life. The fact that I'm still alive. A higher power protecting you. Something. So I'm not trying to get corny, I'm not trying to be religious, mate. You know, I'm just saying to you, how the hell am I still alive today? You know? See, if you did get captured, what would have happened? Captured by the loyalists? Yeah. Oh, I'd been tortured. Tortured to death, you know? Did that happen to a lot of men? Well, a lot. Uh, well, not a, this is a strange thing. Not ARA men, Catholics. ARA men were too shrewd. ARA men are always on alert, you know? You're always waiting for something to happen, but ordinary Catholics got complacent. And they were thinking, no, he wouldn't do that to me. He, he's, he's my neighbor. He's, I've known him for years. The next thing, they're dead. They're shot dead because their neighbor set them up. But an ARA man will always be waiting, waiting for the worst to come. Always alert. You know, one day he's walking down that way the street. Next thing, he takes himself away around here, even though it's away, six miles away to get home. You know? So you ended up in New York. He started tasting a bit of freedom. Mm. Your wife's pregnant. Yeah. You should be thinking to yourself, well, do you know what? I'm going to live the good life, but you end up involved in one of the biggest heists in American history, yeah. $8 million. Like, yeah. What was going through your mind? Like, even though, did you still have that in you? Uh, you needed to survive, make some money, and, well, and still I, have that buzz about it? Before the big robbery, I had one of the greatest jobs I'd ever imagined. I was working in a casino, and I was getting so much money. Every day you're getting paid, you're getting a tip every day. I had so much money, I couldn't deal with it, you know? I'm talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. You're seeing all these actors, famous boxers coming to the casino. Was, I, was in the, I didn't like to go home in case I missed something. I just loved working. I worked seven days a week. I was a workaholic, you know? But I met this friend of mine who helped get me into America. He was an American cop. Now, here's a contradiction. Here's an ARA man, and his best friend's a, a cop, you know? See, that wouldn't happen over here. You know, we shoot the cops over here. But you got to think differently because this is an American cop, Irish American cop, and all they're thinking about is hot dogs, watching a baseball game, and they're about, oh, I'm going to kill a Catholic, I'm going to kill a Protestant, you know? So people are always think, fuck, Sam, you fall, people, you've got a best mate who's a cop. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, it's a strange thing. But this guy himself was a legend. He highly decorated for bravery, numerous occasions, stopped armed robbers and all that sort of stuff. But he was also Malcolm X's bodyguard. And then when he came to New York, he was one of the cops assigned Malcolm X's bodyguard, you know, because he was so highly respected, you know, among the black people up in Harlem and all. So he was a guy, he worked in this place, it was a beer place, as a, you know, just making beer. But he also had a second job, and that was Brinks. And the Brinks was it's like a big fortress where all these armored cars come from the whole of America. And they deposit all the money from the banks and they sits in this big fortress. It's like Fort Knox when it's called Brinks. You know, it's very, very famous in America. And he worked there as a security guard, there on extra money. And a few times I was up 
during the 4th of July, we'd be sitting eating hamburgers. During the 4th of Ju July, just celebrating America and kicking the Brits out of America. And the next thing you look at all these safes, the size of this room, filled with money, not even locked. And all of a sudden, my man's going, this is crazy, this is ridiculous. This is absolute. And I used to say, why isn't why is that closed? I said, what's the point of closing? We're going to take it out soon and get it burnt or move it on to another part of America. So it's, they're that lazy. They got that lazy and complacent. They didn't even like the safes. And all the money's just coming out, spilling out, you know? And then I go back to New York and thinking I'm talking to someone, but I'm not. I'm thinking about all these safes for all this money in this fort. And I just couldn't get it out of my head. And then after a while, I finally says, you know something? It's, it's just aggravated me. It's like a cheeky thing. They're like saying, come on, dare you. And I did it. You know, I said, I said I'm going to rob the Brinks, get as much money as I can. I'm talking about, I wanted a couple of hundred thousand. Because I said, if I can get a couple of hundred thousand, that's enough for me. You know, I live a life, of, you know, little did I know what was coming, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you think that was a test from God to see if you were changed? Oh, man? No, I shouldn't have done it, you know. Maybe it was a test of God because I regret doing it. I would have fucking done it as well, uh, mate. No, so, yeah, I, I did it and I loved doing it. It was more like well, back to the old days, yeah. you know what I mean? It was just the whole adrenaline, <laughs> the, the cheekiness of it, you know what I mean? But afterwards, I regret it. I'm not saying it because, oh, yeah, I seen religion. I should never have done it because America was good to me. The first country I ever tasted freedom. I got a good job. I looked after my wife, my kids, you know? It was a great country and I love America. I love America. And afterwards, it's sort of like my family disowned me, you know, after it. And my friends disowned me. It took a long time for anybody to start talking, talking to me again. You know, I was ostracized, really. Yeah, the Americans. Once, once are, I was caught, like yeah, you know, the Americans are good. I love the Americans as yeah. well. They're crazy, but they welcome people from all over the world. Oh, yeah. it's a great place. But it is. so, when you're thinking about doing that, then would you? Did you never think about doing the casino you were in? No. Oh no, no, no way. I was put in charge of casinos by a guy called Johnny Mac, second generation Americans. And because I was spent time in Long Cash, he was a big Republican supporter. He knew, trusted me without a thought. I would never, ever do a thing. I would never take a penny. And all the ones that worked in the casino, half of them were all ARA men from the hit blacks. And he knew he was well guarded, that nobody was going to steal a penny out of that place. And I worked my way right up the ladder. I became what was known as a box man. I took all the money from all the boxes inside the casinos, all of them, every night, filled them hundreds of thousands of dollars, taking away the safe place, and he knew there wouldn't be one dollar missing, and there never was. See, when you go there for the clean life, as part of you miss the old Sam, though, living in the war zone, living in the madness, because you were so used to it that you thought you wanted that extra buzz again? Yes. I, I, I didn't know what it was, you know, at the time, but you used to look back and think, oh, I've got a great casino, a lovely house, and wife, and but... You're getting bored, yeah, you know, it's not it's a terrible thing to say, you're getting bored because you don't see a war going on, you know, it's nothing like that, you know, but there's just something missing in the back of your head. So when the, the brinks came up, I was like, oh God, this is great. This is like something being sent to me, you know, back again to see if I'm still got the balls that I used to have, you know, and that's what it all came down to, you know, I mean, I was testing myself, you know. <laughs> but when, when I went, I had this target in the back of my head, you know, 100, 200, 000, and I thought, you know, it'll do me, it'll be nice, you know. That's what I, my target was when I went into the Brinks to rob it. Like, you know, I wasn't going to take anything else. How did you plan it? The plan went on for about two different, well, it went on for basically for two years. The plan was so simple. Sometimes I say the best plans are the simple plans. You know, don't make it too complex. Don't make it too difficult for yourself. But because I'd been up there so many times inside the fort, I seen the lack of security. There's one notorious thing that came out in the court. Sometimes they're at lazy. They refused to lock the gates. They left a wee bit of wood or a pencil. So as a pizza man delivery used to come, so as he wouldn't have to do all the hassle of pressing bells and buttons and the guards that come down let him in. They'd just have the pencil and push the pencil out of the road and go in through the doors and get in. And I couldn't believe all these things. I was taking note of all these stupid things that they were doing. You know, it's just American complacency. American, they were getting lazy. They were getting paid nothing. They are getting paid buttons. Yet here they are guarding hundreds of millions of dollars, like, you know. And the plan had come different times. And the way you're thinking, that's crazy. You're, you're going to get shot dead. You're going to bring shame to your family. After all you went through, you know, you're going to get caught. You're going to bring shame to your family, all this here. And then you're going to go to penitentiary, if if you're lucky. And you don't get shot dead, because these guards are going to shoot you dead for doing this craziness. These thoughts are going through your head. And then the wee devil comes on the other side and he said, no, you can do it. You know you can do it. You've done better things than this. You can do it, you know. 
but then a wee good person, don't don't be fucking listening to him. You're going down. You're going to jail. You know, you're going to be killed. You know, but that's how it started. How was that when you're planning that for two years? Like the the good and evil's on your shoulders, and yeah. everybody's shoulder. When you've got your wife there, you've, you're making money, but then you know what you put your dad through the last time. Yeah. And yet we still seem uh -huh. like you've done fucking mad stuff, but you, people who I interview, they still seem to choose that extra bit of right. something when their life is going good. This test, uh -huh. the powers of whoever controls this universe. You're like, 100%, you're 100 cost, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, 100%. Because I kept saying, so why would you even think you've got everything? <laughs> Look at where you're living. You're living in a beautiful neighborhood. You know, you've got a comic book store. The dream of your life, because I always dreamed about having a comic book store, you know, in New York. So you've got everything going for you. You've got the casino, money, so much money, you can't spend it, you know. Your kids are going to great schools. Your wife's hobby. Why would you fuck that up? But, of course, I fucked it up. As usual, you know, it's just something in me. And there was a priest involved? Yeah, a priest, yeah. He calls himself a priest, you know. I don't want, I'm not going to rip the bag out of him, because he's not here to defend himself. Although he ripped the bag out of me, magazines, newspapers all over him, you know. Did he, yeah? Oh, fuck Cheeky bastard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Typical, you know. And I always vowed, I'm, I'm never going to go down as low as him, you know. I'm never going to fucking rip, while well, he's not here to defend himself, but he was a bit of a rascal, like, you know. There was a lot of tragedy involved in the Brinks. And one of the biggest tragedies was there was a, a guy from Liverpool, an Irish guy. He was involved. He wanted to do the first robbery. But we got up there and when we just, it was a winter. And just as we got approaching the fortress, he, back, he, turned, up, he turned away. He chickened out, you know. And he always thought that he should have parts of a robbery, even though he wasn't going to take part in it. You know what I mean? I was I don't like that sort of an attitude. Like, you know, you're you're chicken out, but you want everybody else to go and fucking put their life on the line, you know? So when he found out two years later that the pranks had been done, he just went one on one as two. He knew who it was. So he started coming around this priest who's a well known figure in the Irish American, looking after poor people down the village, you know. And he knew he and I, the priest, had had a friendship because they had to get all this furniture and all and give it to him so she'd give it to the poor and all this sort of stuff, you know? So Ronnie was watching and he knew Father Pat, as he calls himself, knew where I was. And he went to Father Pat one day, he says, look, tell Sam I know what he did, but all I want is 100,000. I keep my mouth quiet, you know? My Father Pat was against me giving him money, you know? And I says, look, it's only 100,000. Look at the money we have, a room, half, see, a half, that says this room was filled with dollars up the scene. Couldn't spend it, you know, with eight million dollars sitting in this room. And he says, You're, you don't want to give them a hundred thousand, it's only chicken feed, it's crumbs. So he says to me, okay, 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 I'll give it to him. A week later, I met the priest, he says, yeah, it's okay, take, taken care of, I'll give him it. You know, I didn't find out until the trial started that he didn't give it to him. And that's what started the whole shit. That's what caused us all to be caught. Fucked you over? You know? I found it underneath his bed, you know. I says, and he wouldn't talk to me, see, during the trial, because he knew this was going to come out. We didn't know the FBI had videotapes off us. It was terrible, like, you know. So on the way to the job, how did you plan it out on, on the day of it? Well, I lived in New York, and it's up in Rochester. It's eight-hour drive, and it's quite, quite, uh, you're going up through the throughway. It's lovely, but it's during the winter. Quite treacherous. I mean, when snow falls in America, it falls. It's not like a snow falls here. Like, my in Scotland's quite deep, you know. But over here, it's nothing. Like, a bit weary driving up there. But I met this guy who worked in the casino. He was one of our big guards, you know. And he'd done, he was an American Marine at the time. Retired, got a lot of frigging injuries and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, he's the guy to go with me. Because Ronnie was supposed to do it with me. That's the guy from Liverpool. And I sort of way I thought, that's an omen. Not to do it. The fact that Ronnie chickened out, that was the first time. And I sort of way I believed it. I reconciled with myself, this wasn't supposed to be getting done. It was a saying, forget about it. But a year later, it starts going through my head and we got up there. And I knew it was, you had to go in the way I told him. I knew the cop would be on. I knew how to get in without anyone being hurt. It was a priority. No one could be hurt, even though we could be shot dead. I says, nobody should be hurt. Nobody should be killed. If we do it my way, swift for balls, you know, not thinking about it, we'll do it, we'll get in. And we did it. One of those coppers you were worried about because you knew he would shoot. There was an old guy in it. You know, he's one of these guys always watching these John Wayne movies and all, mm -hmm. twiddling his gun up in there and all this bullshit. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like about, I want to get somebody coming in here and I shoot the balls off, you yeah. know? So I was warned about him. 
So I see the R guards, they'll do the right thing. They'll just drop the, they don't give a shit. They're not there to save money. You know what I mean? So, but that's the guy you got to watch. He's, a, he's the one that'll shoot anybody that comes. You know what I mean? So I was listening to all this and I thought, this is a guy that's going to shoot me. I thought, oh, I, I forget the name we had for him, you know? But he kept saying, I'm going to shoot the bastard in the balls first as I'm talking, you know? And then I shoot him in the head. You know, so he kept saying these things, you know? I thought, this bastard's going to blow my balls off, you know? Mm -hmm. He's going to shoot me in the head. But he was the one I was worried about. But he's about 70 years of age. You think it had more sense, you know? But I think he was just living a second life, you know, as a cowboy <laughs> or something, you know? <laughs> See, when you're driving towards it, what's the feeling you've got? Dread, excitement. This is it. You know, it's our showtime or shit time. One or two. You know, you got a chance to turn back, but you, this guy's telling you, you can't turn back. You can't. But there's something saying, you fucking, what, you're crazy? Turn back, turn back. It's no shame. You haven't let anybody down, you know, except yourself. But this bastard in me is going, you're not turning back and you know you're not turning back. Yeah. Let's get up there. Get this <laughs> thing, <you laughs> Changed your life. Everything going great, making dollar. I and know. then you end up, it's Absolutely fucking... Absolutely stupid, you know, stupidity. Yeah, but, so when you're in there, how many guards were there? There was two, four, six where we were. And there was different guards over in the R section who couldn't hear what was going on. It's such a big, it's a massive place, you know. All the money from the west, from the east coast, sorry, would come there. So the night that we went in, there was over 40 million. We went up in this little van, you know, tiny van, it's no bigger than that table. We stupid van, because I say we were, we were only going to get like 100,000, 200,000, be happy, you know what I mean? More, more, more than enough, you know. But we went in and we started packing all the money in the van. Packed it right till you couldn't put a penny in, you know, close it. We got in the van to get out to hell because you knew that the alarms were going to start going off shortly, you know. And we got in and the fucking car wouldn't start. All the black smoke was coming out from the engine, you know, because there's too much weight on it. So we're sweating like pigs because it took us so long to get the money in. Then we're getting out again. So we started pulling the money out. And we don't know how much money we're taking out. And we don't know how much money we've left. But we finally got enough money in and to get out. The car's still going. So we get out. And the gates, just as we get out, the gates are coming down because the alarms are starting to go off in the FBI and all has been alerted, you know. So we found out that we left about 20 odd million behind. We took with us just over, around about 8 million, 7.5 million. So the, the, the alarms went up straight away? The alarms went up within minutes of us leaving. And helicopters were in the air, cops everywhere, state troopers were out everywhere. Now we had to get back to New York, which is eight hours away on the throughway, driving down, or all this money in the back. So you can imagine what we were thinking, and you're hearing the helicopters above you, just like Belfast, you hear the helicopters all the time, you know? And you're thinking, this is where we're going to go into this guard, the cops are waiting for us, FBI shootout. And I thought they're going to hit the petrol tank and I'm going to go fucking into flames and I'll go straight to hell and all, and all this shit's going to through my head, like, you know? It was a long, long trip home, back to New York. What did you tell your wife that night? Oh, she didn't know. She thought I was working in the casino with the manager, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Just, and this is where it gets fucked up because I'm trying to assure her no, no she's not thinking anything she doesn't know anything about it like, you know? so I went and make a phone call so I says okay babe how's things she says okay when are you coming home I said oh, I'm doing a double shift tonight so I'm going to get home about 4 o'clock in the morning you know she says okay take care and I get home safe and all. be careful at subway because I always took the subway into work you know I mean she's always worried about somebody stabbing me in the subway you know now I see when I hung that phone up little did I know that phone call came back to haunt me because they were able to track it to my house that I called. It was a stupid thing to do. And did you not know that then? I never thought about it then. It wasn't thing. The adrenaline yeah. stopped my brain thinking. Yeah, because then... I made so many stupid mistakes. You know, you look back and you think, yeah. fuck. Because her. then there's no cameras, there's yeah. no DNA. No, like, no, that's what I'm saying. If you're kind of in and out, you're driving away with the money, there's a good chance, a good percentage that you're, you're not going to get caught. Like. That's it. I mean, we got right into New York, got right into the house. I parked a car in a garage open door garage, I imagine. All these people parked their cars, like a public garage, and left it and went to bed where all the money's sitting, you know? Anybody could have just went in and got that car, you know, and took it or looked in even, spotted and seen all the bags, what the hell's in there, you know? Especially in New York, like, you know what I mean? Like, and you ended up getting surveillance from the FBI for six months? Okay. And you never knew, did you? No, never knew a thing. You no, know, you always want. have that inkling. No. Usually, you get a gut no, no. feeling. But if I'm, even, I'm not, I'm don't do anything no, no. anymore. But there's still an inkling that he's a copper. That's it. That's what. Yeah. That's what. I, it was one time. There was only one time during the whole nonsense. I was in uh, down the village, 
and it was coming out with all these big bags of money. We were moving it from one place to another, you know, I had these big duffel bags full of, it was hard to freaking lift. So I'm going into this place where we're, we're putting the money in this apartment, and there's a black guy, or, you know, and the next thing a black guy opens the door for me, and that was the time, the back of my head said, they're fucking on to me, because there's no way a black guy in New York is going to open the door for a white guy, you know? But he was actually opening the door so as he could follow me in the elevator to see what was on in the, uh, he was in the bad guy. He was in charge, he was the main at bad guy. This black guy was undercover. And he was there to try and get in the elevator with me. I stopped and I said, no, go your head, sir. Go you on first in front of me. So he was trying to get me to go out because he wanted to see what floor I was on. And he's missed you know, his flats. But I knew, yeah, I mean, uh, something's wrong, you know. So when you think you're doing a job for 100, 200 grand, and then you start counting the money couldn't, out, couldn't and you realise you've nearly got eight million dollars. No, I, re I realised it fucked up. Why? So big, I knew it was in the shit. 200, 30, I mean, get away with, you know, go on for a couple of months, people looking for you. But when you take that sort of money, it's, you're, you're going to get caught, your fancy the FBI is going to go out for you. They'll, they'll find you, you know. And you had to teach, did you change the tires on your van or something? Yeah, like that? it was an hour fuck up. Because we got a tip from the cops, like we, we had friends, lots of cops, friends, you know, and they says on the phone, a quick phone call, just says, get rid of tires. They're off to the tire print. You left the tire print behind because it was snowing. And we went in this big fort, it was all snowy, it was all nice and dry. So our prints go on just like liquors. I left the big print there. Of course, I didn't know it at the time, you know, they could take it like a fingerprint. The tire print was like a fingerprint, you know, and that was another reason that they caught me, you know. It's true. What are you thinking then, like after six months, like no, and that like you've no idea that the coppers are following you and you think you're away scot free with the money? Were you spending it though? though? Were you buying no, cars, I wasn't. jewelry? Like? No, this is a part terrible thing about it. This is a terrible thing about the whole fucking thing. I never, I wanted rid of it. I was getting migraine headaches because of the smell. The smell is paper money. It was horrendous. You would really need a gas mask to go in. It was, it's hard to explain this fucking fumes that were coming off this old money, you know? And I was getting sick of it. And I was just trying to get rid of it. I was giving out money left, right and center to all the, the homeless, the hobos down in the Hell's Kitchen, Vietnam vets. I'm not trying to sound like Robin Hood Robin here. Robin Hood, yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to do it to get rid of a lot of it, you know? You couldn't, and the more you got rid of it, that seemed to grow. You couldn't get <laughs> fucking rid of it, you know what I mean, like? <laughs> and I just, that's when I contacted Pat. I said, Pat, I've got some money. You, you know people, maybe you can, headed for me so he's thinking I must have 20,000 I'm an illegal alien working in the casino you know put some money away from me and then when he seen it he threw away like was shocked but he didn't turn his back so he says a thing he says yeah okay you know and then he was doing all sorts of wee dodgy stuff behind my back you know but that's as he's not here to defend himself and not willing to talk about <laughs> you know if you want to know about it, just read Donna Brinks my mm -hmm. memoir where the yeah. whole book's in you know we'll leave the link to your book um, yeah, very good so when you get how did you get caught? Well, there's a Queens where I was living, eventually. There's a big post office. I used to go in there and get all the money changed in the post office money orders, you know? And I'd had a shop going, a couple of shops going, so I was using them to clean this sort of thing. It was a very amateur. I wasn't really thinking. I was getting complacent because I thought I got away with it, you know? But I remember this uh, Monday morning, I forget, I went down. And just as I went into the post office, the place was buzzing. There's fruit stalls everywhere owned by the Koreans and all, you know, bakers. It's always buzzing. Jackson Heights never stops. So I never thought of anything off. Went in, got myself, got the change, got the money changed and came out. The minute I opened the door, you couldn't hear a pin drop. All the fruit stores and all are locked up and there wasn't a sinner in the streets. This is a street for thousands of people. And all of a sudden there's not a sinner. And do you think you go, hmm, something strange here. And it was like a zombie movie. All of a sudden, what the fuck happened here, you know? And I knew there. I was caught, I was finished. So I just went up the street, my van was parked two streets away, and I just knew it was only a matter of seconds before I'm gonna be arrested, you know? And I went up, the minute I put my hand on the door handle off the van, they came from everywhere, the FBI. You know, started screaming, saw them, where's your guns, where's your guns? I never had a gun, never had a gun, you know? But they obviously thought I was walking around, you know, I'm gonna shoot it out, but these guys don't know all this shit's in their heads, you know? You know? And that what, was it. What are you thinking then? Like, what, what, when did it come to the realisation that you'd fucked up again? Like? There, at that second, my life's finished. Who pops into your mind? Your mum, your, your wife or your dad? My wife, kids. Never thought of anybody else. Wife and kids. I said, I fucked this up and this is the biggest fuck up I, I've ever done in my life. I'm Tens never, never going to get out of it. Potential life sentence? Oh yeah. No, I'm never going to get out. I'm, dead. I'm going to die in penitentiary. I had it already. It all came flourishing at me. You know, I mean, I knew exactly what was waiting for me. That sort of money. <sighs> 
no way. Especially tying up people and tying up people, you know, you charge yeah. for kidnapping them and all this here sort of mm -hmm. stuff, you know. So when you get took to the cop shop, like was that straightforward or was it still trying to well, did you charge thing it straight is, away? See, here's the thing. The FBI never dealt with anybody like me, because I already know interrogations. I mean, I went through interrogations where you get tortured, yeah. you know? So these guys, for, first thing insult me is by the Senate and all these Irish American FBI guys, and they come in, they start to the bullshit, talk about, oh, they love a good Irish beard. Did you ever meet the, and then start talking about Blarney, Leprechaun bullshit, you know, it's insulting. But I just sit there and I refuse to talk to anyone. And I get angry because I've never understood, I've never met anybody in America who's never talked to them. They always talk, every, all Americans talk, they all give themselves away, they'll stop, start talking, you know. But I would, I refuse to talk to them for three days up in Police Plaza One where they were holding me, you know. And they said, you're going to the penitentiary, your wife's been arrested, you know, they're hitting them all this shit, your kids are going to go to an orphanage. So you're still sitting there trying to be calm, but you know you're not, you're fucking inside, you're dying because you're thinking, fuck, that could be true what they're saying, but you're not, we're giving you this one and only chance to get down first. That's what's called in America if you want to be a tout, being a former, get down first, that's what's called. They come to you and let you come, go first, to squeal on your friends. So the cats start going, they've got the priest, my heart's beating fucking, you know, say like, you know, and I'm still trying to keep my face straight, you know, and we got your friend, the cop O'Connor, my face must have dropped down because I'm thinking, fuck, con has got on to do it, but they've brought him in there, obviously, because of my connection, and we've got this our guy, Charlie McCauley, call him, I never heard of Charlie calling him in life. He says, yeah, we know him, he's, he's an arm master, man, I never knew who the hell Charlie McCauley was. Found out later, he's a guy on the apartment, he's away in Hawaii, father pat behind his back, uses his apartment without telling him, to put all the money in. So to have him, to bring him in, a teacher never been in trouble in his life, never had a parking ticket, you know? Now all of a sudden he's a big bank robber, poor guy, like he's never in trouble in his life, fucking shattered. I didn't know how, who he was or what he was. It wasn't until during the trial I started to find out who this guy was. He owned the apartment. He was a good friend of Father Pat's. Father Pat knew he was in Hawaii. So he says, could I borrow your apartment for a couple of weeks? Didn't say like, I've got eight million stolen dollars here, you know, I just says, could I borrow it? He always thought, well, Father Pat looks off our immigrants, he's probably going to put a couple of illegal aliens in there. That's probably what was going through Charlie's head at the time. Felt, felt terrible for Charlie. Shattered, out of his world. He wasn't in that sort of a world, you know? And you guys, I see, it's terrible. His family, his mother and father, and all was there, not the court hearings. That was, that was a terrible time. How long did it take for you to get charged? Two years, because what they were doing with me, the priest, the teacher, and the cop was so funny. Like all the New York Times had it, it was a uh, the priest, the teacher, the decorated cop, and the ARA revolution. Like a joke in it, you know. And you're thinking, <laughs> what the fuck is that, you know? <laughs> so, and they all got bail. It's the only in America. I mean, you would never get bail in New York County, you know. Mm -hmm. But the only reason I didn't get bail because I was no legal alien. I refused to become American, you see, you know, because I didn't want to give up my Irish citizenship. So they couldn't let me because I was classified as an illegal alien. So they started doing this thing called me, uh, you know, diesel therapy. What it is, they put you in these trucks, pickup trucks, where we prison or we sell, made up inside the, the truck, two guards at the front, and start traveling through the mountains. This is during the winter now, you know. So I'm only, I've only got a wee uh, jumpsuit on. I'm handcuffed all over the place, you know. I start taking us to all the mountains, you know, tearing you out. You're not getting any food. You're exhausted, you know, and the smell of fumes from the engine, the diesel, starting to give you terrible migraine headaches, you know. So it's called diesel therapy. The FBI use it to break people down. You want to think I've got a potential person who's going to turn and turn state's evidence. So I thought that, but after about three months, they knew they weren't going to get anything from me. They couldn't believe it. After the trial, my lawyer says, see all the FBI guys, you all want to come and shake your hands because of what you endured and you didn't give one person up. He says, I've never seen anything like it in their life. Was that easier for you compared to what you've went through anyway? Uh, oh yeah, it was a lot easier than the hits blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, it was nothing. It was just like a fucking ride. Like it was nasty, like don't get me wrong. It was, it was nasty, like having to go through mountains and on, going to prison and when you get into prison, you get in there at three o'clock in the morning, you go through all the search and procedure, which is about three hours, you know, and all this shit. You get into the cell, you don't know who you're getting put in the cell with, you know, fuck, you know. And next thing you make a bed, you're just getting into it, you're beat. Next thing, come on. And you're getting moved again to our prison, you know, 20, 20 hours away. So we're doing this for two years to break you down, you know. It's not like a ghost run. It's terrible. And, but when you went to court, like, there was a massive fuck up because you, it was against your human rights to be getting yes, travelled so just, far. Yeah, this is the only in America, you know. So my, my, we had these lawyers. One of them was David Bowie's lawyer, you know. And, uh, 
he came to said, we we're, we're all having a big meeting. I mean, this is all the guys who'd done the robbery having a meeting inside the courthouse with all the lawyers. It's so funny, like, you know. So one of them's going, listen, we're going to put this proposal to the judge tomorrow. I'm not listening because I don't believe it. I know I'm going for life. You know what I mean? I'm going to, so I'm not listening anymore. I don't want to listen anymore. I'm feeling all wrapped up in self pity. I'm not listening to all this bullshit, you know. And they're saying, we're going to put this proposal to the judge at your human rights. You know, we're broke. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? She says, they shouldn't have moved you from New York. They sh that's where, the, where you lived. But they brought you all the way up to Rochester because it's a hellbilly town full of cops and they know the jury will convict you in, in a heartbeat, you know. So I didn't believe it. I went back to my cell in the county jail, you know. The next thing this guy says, you know, you've got one of the best lawyers in New York, Tony Morali and all this. You know? I goes, yeah, 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 whatever. So I went over to the court the next day and the judge dropped all the major charges because my human rights have been violated. I mean, fuck, only in America. <laughs> only in America. You know what I mean? I couldn't believe it. And then I found out I could only get five years. It was like I won the lotto. I just went, oh, fuck, can't believe it. I can only get five years, you know? It's unbelievable. Did people ever question that, like you were going for life and then get five years as if you had turned queens on anybody? Oh, no, no, no. It was all, no, because of press. It's always so much in the press and the lawyers all, and everything's in the press, what the judge says, and then... The, the editors would look at that and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's why it happened. And all. No, there's no way you can cover anything up, like, you know what I mean, like, you know? And then, of course, once the arm sentence, I get five years, because the judge said to me, he says, you're up to your eyeballs in this, but I can't do anything about it, you know? So you're always sitting there and you're, you know, you feel a wee bit embarrassed when he's saying that, like, you know? He says, yeah, I sat through this trial and I know you were guilty 100%, you know? What was he get caught with? In the, was it with conspiracy? Conspiracy so, to have stolen money. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was dropped. And over five million was never found. Oh, uh, five and a half million. Five and a half million. <laughs> of course, my mates, my mates still think they've got it hit the garden. And all, yeah, you know? yeah, you, well, you did come up every now and again yeah. with shovels. But you did pull up here with a Rolls Royce, so you know? was behind in something. Yeah. <laughs> but so you've got five stretch. Yeah. Like to be in, still here and to still tell your tale, like you, you're definitely protected from something like yeah, to so get all all these chain of events to yeah. kind of it's kind of mad it is like a fiction book that is, it's not really yeah it's unbelievable like, i've done over 250 interviews like this is one of the best stories i've heard like it's, uh, it's just you. fucking mental yeah it's it just mad so what was it like in the american jails well i was lucky once again i was taken care of by the hell's angels and there are some american gangsters you know, Hell Jesus have this affinity with the IRA because I think the IRA is out to destroy the system. That the Hell Jesus have that sort of thought in the back of our head, you know, they hate the system, hate the cops, anybody hates the cops. It's good enough for us and all. Because I was always taken care of all the prisons I went to, you know, I was very lucky, you know. I was like, I had a horseshoe up my arse, you know what I mean? Wherever I went, everybody just took care of me, you know what I mean? So I was taken care of pretty good. And I just sat there waiting for my days to count down. No one was getting sent back to Ireland, you know, back to Belfast. What was it like then? Like, the Irish have always got con Irish have got connections all around the world because they're loved like, yeah. and they run New York as well there's a yeah. high percentage of the Irish in oh, New yeah. York yeah. who have got a lot of power like. yeah. um, what was the Hells Angels in that like, like how were you treated like, with the, who's it you've got so many different gangs in yeah. these kind of prisons like, did they ever try and like, like, say the Republican Army like, try and get you in like, no. to, like, was they, anybody they try and get you into their gang or? they had so much respect and fear about the IRA. They always, you know, they knew what they were capable of doing, like, you know, because they always thought I was going to get a helicopter out of the prison. Their, their heads were full of shit, like, you know, and they <laughs> said, yeah, we know Sam's not going to be here long. You see a helicopter's going to come pick him up. No, they used to believe mm -hmm. all this shit, like, you know. But they always take care of me, but I was never affiliated with them. But, you know, if somebody's helping you to stop from getting stabbed and all, like, you're not going to refuse to take it, you know. I mean, I had the right wing nutcases, the skinheads and all. And they all had this thing, you're a Catholic, we're going to take care of you. you know, everybody had their reasons, you know what I mean? So I, just, I was taking care of wherever I went, you know? Good Even run. though you never agreed with them, I mean, I mean the skinheads mm -hmm. and all, I don't, I don't understand that, the right wing, because I was as left wing as anything, you know? But I'd say, uh, they were good, funny, you know, they're good people. So you get to know them personally. They're, they're the people you can sit down and have a drink with. You just wouldn't like to be associated with them, you know? Yeah. Uh, who, who ran the jail? Who ran it? Everyone had their own, you know, black black community had theirs. Mexicans. The white, you know? Maxins had them. It was a quite dodgy sort of place. You just had to be careful, you know. Do you have to be on your toes more then than you had? In no, the I block? no, I was quite chilled. No, no, it was the thing is the hits blocks was a horrendous nightmare, but you always had your comrades, and that's one thing you know. Once you had them, you didn't give a shit. You could have went through hell. 
knowing you had your comrade next door in the cell with you. Over there, you're on your own. Is it a single cell? No, when I mean on your own, I mean it's a mental thing. You're yeah. on your own. There's nobody else going to frigging attack but when you. You're there, is it like bars? You can see through the bars. Single no, cell, no, you it, get bunk beds. No, it's no, it's quite. Uh, it's a federal system, so it's quite uh, like I won't say luxurious, but the cells are done nice. You no, know, like you've all got your own privacy, sort of a thing. Like you know, what I mean, there's two people in the room, you know. And funny enough, they put me in the cell, and I couldn't believe it. The guys put in was from Derry. He was a gun runner for the IRA, so they tried <laughs> to keep all these IRA men. There was an art guy who worked for NASA. He was an ARA man. He was making rockets while he was work for NASA. Yeah, by arrest of him. So we were all together, you know. They were keeping us in this prison thinking, well, in case there's a big escape, I'll keep them all here together, you know what I mean? Sort of thing. I kept thinking the is going to help. We're going to help like, you know. That just shows you the threat that you do bring because yeah, well, even though you, you know. you've lived that life, so you might not, you're thinking, it's all fucking far-fetched film shit, yeah, but you exactly. have actually lived it where people yeah. have escaped. Thousands of lives have been fucking yeah. took away. Like yeah. You have been in that life of yeah. conflict and madness and involved in one of the biggest robberies in American yeah. history. So you're I going to I, have question marks. I used to always laugh at like, you know what I mean? And then the, the climax was when Bill Clinton intervened. I yeah, mean, that's I, mad, yeah. That was, so that you, was absolutely scandalous. You're in there for five years, but then you get a phone call from the White House yeah. and you're thinking, well, it's it, a joke. Yeah, well, it didn't happen. Like, it came down that the, the scar comes in on his... Saying, uh, Miller, the governor wants to talk to you. The governor lives up in this big hill overlooking the prison, like, you know. And I said, I'm not going to no fucking governor. The guard was shocked. He said, what, what the fuck are you on about? You can't refuse. I said, well, I'm refused. I'm not going, what the fuck does the governor want from me? He said, well, he wants to talk. Yeah, that's all I can tell you. So I refuse. Next thing, but a week later, tried it again. Next thing, I got a message sent in from outside, you know. He says, you're going to get a phone call. Make sure you go up to the governor's office. So I didn't know what the fuck was going on, you know what I mean? So I went up. Governor was there and he was a bit shaky, you could see him, a bit nervous and all, you know. In the house, office, he, he left me. He said, what the fuck going on? He's waiting. He said, this is the FBI. They're going to come through the door. They give me more charges. They're going to blame me and things, you know. Because during this time, Ronnie was murdered. And I'm thinking, they're going to try and pin Ronnie's murder on me and things like this here, you know. All these thoughts going through my head. Next thing, a phone rings. And I'm picking it up. And the woman says, you're going home to Aaron. No, a woman's voice. I never said, I just hung the phone up again. I thought it was the FBI just playing tricks on my mind, no kind of mess with me. So I went back to my cell, no one never thought anything of it. Two weeks later, I got a message saying, a woman has worked for Bill Clinton. You're going home. Next thing, Irish News, that's our local paper here in Belfast, had the headlines, Muller's coming home to Belfast. Part of the Good Friday Agreement. Pardon? Part of the Good Friday Agreement, Bill Clinton agreed to it. And it fucking just shows you my luck like it's just, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I, even I am a bar spat sometimes, yeah, you know. Either you've got some luck or you've you know? got some serious fucking pool. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to think you've just got some serious pool. No, trust me, I, it's just <laughs> fucking crazy luck. I don't know what it is. I'm going to pay for it later in life. I know I'm going to pay, pay, you know. I, I've got away with too many things, you know. Who was Ronnie? Ronnie was the guy from Liverpool who wanted to get on the first robbery, but he chickened out. He was a guy at Far Pop was supposed to give him 100,000 to keep quiet. He got done in? He got, well, this is what it says. They were trying to hint that he went to the FBI and told him he was involved in a Brinks robbery. I've never really believed it so much, you know, although it could be true, but I've always, don't think he would do it at the end of the day. But Far Pat says, yeah, he wouldn't trust him as far as you could throw him and all this shit, you know. Far Pat had to give him the money. Who knows? Yeah, a lot of politics involved as well when you sort yeah. of things and you don't know who to trust. Yeah, but this is what it comes down to, you know, you don't know who to trust. You, know, you think a person's 100% and then all of a sudden you think, fuck, gosh, you shouldn't have trusted him. You find, out who, yeah, you find out who's 100% when the shit I mean, hits the priest, fan. You never think a priest is going to rip the book, you know? You know? Yeah. And he's such a nice wee king priest, you know? <laughs> father, you know? <laughs> now, what's your letters? I was getting a hate from fucking all sorts, nuns and everybody. I was going to hell for what I'd done to Fire Pat. He fucking actually started believing the shit that he was talking like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I was this bad area man, intimidated him into hiding this money, all this shit out there. Like, nobody believed him, like, but he, he had to try and kill himself convinced, you know? Yeah, blaming you. Yeah. What was the jail? What was it like in there? Was there much violence in that prison? Oh, quite a lot of violence. What same you know? kind of well, stuff did you it's see? It's sort of a place you can see the violence coming, you know? When you know a guy's, two guys has not paid a guy, you have no advance. And then my mate was quite. You know, a veteran of prison, like you said, like, this guy's going down the night, so he'll stay at a fucking handball alley. The Maxons are going to cut his fucking head off and all this here. So you always knew where to avoid, like, you know. Who else did you become friends with in there? Oh, different guys, different, mostly gangsters. Chicago, there was a lot of Chicago gangsters and all, like, you know, well known gangsters. 
different, different people, you know. And then the mafia. And oh God, mafia was the mafia are funny. All they're worried about is food. You know, they have all the cooks and they're, oh, they had to be right the lasagna and all this here. But I, I got well on. I tell you what happened one night when the prisons were moving me down freaking. I think I was down to Lewisburg. It's a real nasty place. I was like, I'm no castle convert in this prison. Real nasty place. And we're pushing us all in like cattle, you know. And I remember the room was blacks, Mexicans, a couple of white guys, you know, and there was two old white guys, but they're doing that deliberately. So you just a fight among yourselves. That's all encouraged. See, the guards encourage fight. They don't want any unity. If, this, if the prisoners thought for one second, let's fucking unify here and take on the system. They could change the whole of American system, but they never do. That how racism comes in. You know, but I remember being pushed into this room, squeezed in all these black guys and Mexicans, a couple of old, old white guys. Not too pity me. I actually got a seat. It's very rare to get a seat, you know. But I was in first. I got the seat, and everybody squeezing up against me. I was sitting there, mate, looking down the ground. Don't want to look at anybody. Don't want to get in any trouble. Don't look at somebody. Somebody's like, "What the fuck are you looking at? You bastard!" You know, sticks on. So I just kept my head down. But I seen this, these two old guys. You know, they're fucking must have been about ninety. Here's me now. Nah, fuck it. You know, I got up and I offered one of them a seat. He said, oh, well, thanks, son, you know, all this here. So I never thought nothing of it, you know, just the way I was brought up, like, you know. Fuck that night down in the prison. I'm called up in the third tier, and I'm thinking, what the fuck is this? It's all run by the mafia, you know. He says, come in, come in. This old guy's one of the fucking godfathers in New Jersey. And he gives me a big hug, and all. He says, respect what you did to me, you know. Take your mad seat. You get up. I'll never forget you wherever you go. My name will go with you. It's for the fuck. It's generally where I went, the Italians. Big meals and all waiting for me, and I don't like Italian food. <laughs> That's a <laughs> worst about it, yeah. you know. That's like some Godfather shit, you know? that, isn't it? But it was so strange me getting up mm -hmm. to that one old guy, and that changed, you know, so much. Do you think you feel presence of people in power and people who are high above the ranks that like you just know that somebody's? Oh, you knew. You always knew. You mm -hmm. knew something's going to happen, and somebody would come to you and say, "Sam, don't be going down to handball. Don't be going over to baseball pits today. Just keep away from it." You knew something that, or tonight, tomorrow, somebody was fucking going down, like, you know. Was that an easy sentence for you, even though you're still doing a five because you were getting visits, you were getting phone calls and made it a bit more easier compared to what you're used to? It was easier because you were freedom. You were walking around this big yard where gardens and trees and all, but you weren't getting tortured. You weren't getting beat up by the guards. You know, you kept your nose clean, kept kept your own business to yourself. You know, and that's the way it worked, you know what I mean? Plus, it was only a five-year stretch after me thinking I'm going for life. That's why he just said to myself, you should be doing life. So when you get out, you get deported? Get out. Well, <laughs> I get deported. I go down the, uh, this, I get sent down to JFK, eventually. There's a bit of hassle. Guards come up from one case. I hear these, this big Belfast voice. You ain't going to give us any more fucking trouble, Muller, you know? And I hear, hey, who the fuck's that voice? The next thing the door opens. This is in the, the American penitentiary. There's these fucking four screws from the hits blacks. And I looked at them and they're all old men now, like me. And I was thinking, what the fuck? You know, I couldn't believe it. These bastards will come over to bring me back to Belfast, you know? And they said, you're not going to give us, I just cheeky back. Like I said, well, if you don't give me any fucking trouble, you know? And they're saying, you cheeky bastards, you haven't changed. I don't know all this here. I said, we'll be back to get you tomorrow. We're going out to enjoy ourselves here in New York and all like, you know? But we got the JF candy and I'm in the van. It's all blacked out. And the cops have all surrounded it, you know. It's all specially arranged, you know. We have this big escort, and I hear two of the cops going, this bastard in here, he's worse than the Arabs. He's fucking dangerous as fuck. They're terrified of me. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, what the fuck? He says, one of your most, he is worse than all them fucking Arab bastards. You know, you hear him saying, like, you know. Next thing, BA, British Airways. We got on, they refused to take off because I'm on it. And fair play to the screws. I had to give them a bit of credit. They stayed on it. They said, we're not moving either. So next thing we're doing a standoff on the plane, this big plane sitting in JFK. Next thing FBI gets on board to Washington, comes into your Monica captain and says, you're going to be arrested. You don't fly these guys back there. And it's up to you. She's got an hour to decide. The captain came back in, all the stewardesses and all, flew us out. And that was the last. That was my last incident in America. Were you handcuffed? I was handcuffed until I got onto the plane and they took the handcuffs off. Even though this is where it all started. The captain, the, the guy flying says, he has to stay handcuffed. And I said, no, no, we've got him. There's no, no need for handcuffs. This is where it all started, the whole fucking trouble, you know? And it was funny, see when we reached uh, Belfast, or, or London first there, yeah, and we had to change planes, but everybody had to get off first, just set me in the four screws. The screws started stealing all the towels and all. And all the wee 
sacks and all to give yeah. you in the fucking BA because it's a big first class fucking thing, like, you know what I mean? And they were calling him out. But I had to give him a wee bit of credit. It's the first time I ever give Screws credit, you know, because it says, nah, nah, we're all staying here. We're, he's not going, we're not going, we're all staying. He's not getting handcuffed. That was it. How was it on the plane with them? Did you, was there I any admit, conversation? I admit I did talk to him, you know. I tried not to. But you know, you're on this big fucking trip and you're thinking, fuck sick, you know, and they're showing movies and all that. And he said, Sam, you're going back, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it, you're going back. You know, it's all changed. No, no, it's here. So after a while, you finally go, yeah, really? You know, and those, because for a while, it was just fucking ignored him. You know what I mean? Like, when after a while, he starts talking, he said, oh, yeah, it's all different. I know, you know, all that serious shit, you know. That's the way it was, like, you know. It's mad that to have all that anger and violence and rage and then changing your life and end up bang involved again and then coming back and then. Did you ever think in your mind, though, that you were going back to what you went through the last time? No, I knew I wouldn't go back because IRA, the IRA wouldn't have me. But do not once you're out, you're no, out. No, once, no. What I did in America, it took a long time for me to, to be forgiven for what I did. Is that correct, yeah? Because yeah. they tried to bring the IRA into it. You know, the IRA didn't have to do it. That was fucking big trouble, like, for me, like, you know what I mean? The IRA didn't have to do it. But the newspapers over there were, you know, usually like shit, you know, the IRA must have been involved in this big plot to get all this money, all that nonsense, like, you know. So a lot of my friends, comrades, and all stopped talking to me. My family stopped talking to me. Because it was bringing a lot of negative heat towards... Because there's something done it. Yeah. They were ashamed, you know. They just, they knew, it was a criminal act. What were you expecting to come back to in prison? Were you getting another sentence or were you just to finish off the sentence or were you getting Yeah, released? I was supposed to finish it off, go back to Belfast and finish it off. And our, I think at nine months, and the governor come to me and said, we don't know why you're here. So let me go the next day. And I got the train home. I couldn't believe it, you know. I didn't even spend two days in the place, you know. I was supposed to be here for about six or seven months. Just forget exactly what long it was, you know. And I remember it was down in Derry, McGilligan or somewhere, and they called the place. And uh, I just remember getting the train home. They gave me a train ticket that's all I had no money had no penny just that train ticket I went into Belfast City Centre for the first time in 15 years you know did you ever think you were going to get beat up in that prison in what prison uh, yeah Belfast because it was uh, political status being taken away and we're mixing loyalist prisoners with Republican prisoners and you know Protestant and Catholics but nobody there was no fights I don't know how everybody just was very calm how was that to see for you Pardon? How was that to look at? I was were just, you happy? Or were you I was happy to see that there's no nonsense at all. The nonsense at, about jail, you know, people fighting each other and all that. There, you know, I mean, I was just glad that I'd had enough of it, like you know. But uh, different ways. It was almost like having political status again, the conditions, you know, because the screws really didn't care. You could just see they were just there doing their job at that time. You know, what I mean, they lost all interest and everything. You know what I mean, like, and uh, yeah, totally different all together. You know, how long were you in America for? All together, about 15 years. So you come back and everything's changed and then... Changed big time. So how was it to come back in here and adapt? Was there ever any... Were you ever worried about the laws tr still trying to kill you or the IRA because you brought yeah. some negative press so you've got two sides kind of against you? Yeah, of course. You? I was, I was con more concerned about uh, the IRA. You know, my brothers are all Republicans and all this here sort of stuff and all. And, you know, they wouldn't have showed me any favour, like, you know. So I was always sort of waiting, maybe something bad's going to happen to me, but it never did, you know. But I noticed from my friends, they sort of always shied away from me, you know, the streets and things like that. You know, you just know the hint bizarre, you know, you just feel it. You know, nobody wants to know you, sort of a thing, you know. And when the troubles, did they come to an end like 30 years later? 1999, 1998? Well, yeah, the Good Friday Agreement has started mm. to develop, you know, and more or less was all winding down, mm. you know. And do you feel safe here now? Safe? Yes, you feel safe. I mean, there's nine again things will happen, you know, and you think, oh, maybe something's going to happen tomorrow, you know, like this protocol I had here is a load of nonsense, you know, but it's just people getting winded up, you know, about Brexit and things like that, and the union is thinking they're getting left behind, they're going to get through in the iron, the United Iron, it's all nonsense by politicians, wind them up, but, you know, innocent people will suffer. They go out and just, loyalists could go out tomorrow and shoot a Catholic just for sake of saying to the British government, Oh, we're going to start shooting again if you try it and that's leaving us behind now, you know. Things like that, you just worry about. I worry about my son now, my daughters, you know. That's what I worry about now, more than anything in the world. I don't worry about anything else except them, you know. What was it like writing your book? It was brilliant. It was cathartic. It took all the poison out that was in me. I never thought it would be published. I wrote it in the penitentiary to give me something to do to save me from the violence that was all around me in the, in the penitentiary. So I just sit down, write it longhand, 
and it was great. I was able to go back as a kid, you know, and actually try to forgive my mother when she walked out on us and never came back and things like that there, I was starting to do things with myself, you know, but it was good because then it was bringing back memories of things I'd forgotten that I'd deliberately suppressed. And I knew if the book ever was published, I didn't think it would ever be published, you know, but I thought my family's going to fall out with me again because I'm bringing out dirty laundry of the family because nobody knew about my mother walking up, leaving us behind and all like, you know, things like this here, you know, but I did it. It was the best thing I ever did. Therapy for you? Pardon? Like therapy? It was great therapy. It was cathartic. It took all the poison out of me that I had in my, you know, I hate that I had for certain things, certain people in my life, you know, I found it just real, took like a big weight off my shoulders, you know. Was there any people, like, worried the case they were mentioned or things oh, that no. shouldn't have been I mentioned? Would, I, I never mentioned anybody, but I was sort of like, someone came to me and said, like, Sam, you know better than to mention names. And I said, do you think I'd mention anybody's fucking name? You know, like, who are you to tell me it, you know? But I would, I would never do that. I would never disclose anything like that, you know. And that was your first book, On the Brink? No. It was the first book, but my publisher decided he didn't want me to become well-known through this book. So I wrote a little book prior to it, a few months before it, called Dark Souls, about child abuse. And that was out first to turn, so those people won't go, oh, the only reason he's getting that book published is because he, he wrote On the Brinks, you know. So he wanted me to get this book done on my own merit, Dark Souls on its own. But he had this book on the brinks waiting to come out a few months. And when it came out, it was word headlines. CNN, everybody carried about it, you know. Within 24 hours of the book coming out, Warner Bros. had called the, the buy the rights for the movie. And then Time Magazine, it just, fuck, I didn't know what was happening. I mean, I just thought this was a little book. No, nobody's going to buy it, nobody's going to read it. And next thing my publisher calls me from Galway, says, I'm the fucking, everybody's off, wants to know about this book. I want to interview Warner Brothers has bought the rights to it, blah, 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 you know? So or, or if my word started again. I couldn't get a job in Belfast. The next thing, I've wrote this bestseller. <laughs> and that was the start of me becoming an international fucking writer, you know? It's unbelievable. So the, the book Dark Souls, where does that come from? I came from an incident that I know in my life. One of my friends who was sexually... Uh, molested as a child and his whole head his whole mind was fucked up you know and he died very young never got justice you know and I always thought you know sometimes somebody needs to tell his story I never thought it'd be me I said somebody needs to come out you know I always watch these shows you're thinking oh this guy's been exposed at last you know and I just thought you know something I'm going to write about change the names you know but, but people would know people in that area know who I'm talking about they know who the, the victim is they know who the perpetrator is you know so that was a good way of getting poison out of my system too, you know. Plus it established me a wee bit as a writer. No, it wasn't a big book. Never got big, big reviews or nothing, you know, I wasn't really worried because they were just wanted this book to come out where people wouldn't say, oh, he wrote Dark Souls after On the Brinks because Dark, everybody wants to see what he's like, you know, because after On the Brinks was such a great book, got great reviews and all this here, you know. So that's how it started. Have you ever seen a psychologist or a therapist to no. talk about your past? No. I've been offered it to different people, my publisher and all, and says, you know, he knows, says, some what you're carrying isn't good. But I hide it a lot, you know. You know, my kids, I the first time read On the Brinks last year, I call them kids, like a 30 years of age, 28, you know, and they did not realize what my life had been because I never told them anything about my life. And they think they were horrified, you know. It's so strange, really, you know. It's something I avoided showing in the book, you know, even though they knew about this book. They could have went and bought it and all, but they, they knew I didn't want them to read it till last year, and I said to them, it's up to you if you want to read it. Nah, it's up to you. This is your daddy. You know, you just make your own decisions, what you think, you know. Yeah, because you seem like a very stubborn man anyway. Oh, for frick's sake, it's, it's stubborn. It's not the right word for it, you know. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes we don't want to admit that but you've been through hell. You've been in hell. Many, not just once, but many yeah, occasions, yeah. Sam. Like, and you can still sit here and smile. And I think it shows you your character. Like if I was going into battle, man, I want you standing right next to me because I know how fucked up you are. Like. Yeah. <laughs> but, but to be there and still kick on and then to then change your life and write best-selling books, like, it shows you your character. Like, yeah. You never ever gave up in life. You never yeah. just accepted that you, yes, you've made mistakes, but, Every man on this planet has, every man That's and right. woman. Like, yeah. But for you to then go, do you know what, and, and still kick on and 
with everything you've been through your mother leaving you is probably the catalyst as well to then get involved in other things to feel part sure. of something yeah. the, the mother figure's not there anymore so you tend to see like, a lot of people I interview that they, they come from broken homes mm -hmm. no mother or no dad but they want to join a gang or they want to join something yep. to feel like part of a brotherhood where they feel as if they're getting loved yeah. even though sometimes it's fake love but they just want to feel part yep. of something like everything you've went through that like, and still to be here to tell the tale that yeah. I take my hat off to you brother yeah, that's unbelievable it. that how many books have you written now 14 12 12 12 but I mean I've got loads of books out in France Italy Germany everywhere I just came back from a big or my books just came back a new book in France I couldn't believe the reception I received every major newspaper magazine praised it as the best book I've ever wrote and that comes from on the brinks which was worldwide critically acclaimed you know and I just keep sending away what the fuck's happening here, you know? Why is everybody back again, you know, giving me praise again, you know what I mean? It's just incredible, you know, it's unbelievable, you know? Are you not used to that, Sam? No, I'm always uh, suspicious, I guess, you know, I just shy away from it, you know, and I never really look to see what's happening, you know? I had a stage play here and there and it caused a bit of trouble, you know? It was one of the biggest selling stage plays ever, you know, sold out everywhere, but the BBC caught on to it and it caused a lot of problems, like, you know? And I thought, yeah, I'm not going to write again. I'm fed up. I said, no, you know, but you can't. Once it's in you, you just can't stop, you know. What was the stage play about? It was called Brothers in Arms. It was about me getting a dig at Sinn Féin. I, it was like a, two brothers. My, it was actually about myself and my brother, you know. And we're at my father's wake. And the two of us, you know, there's a sort of resentment among both of us. But we've always kept the lid closed because we don't want to cause any more rifts in the family, you know. And my brother's a big... Sinn Féin supporter, he's been Sinn Féin all his life, you know, where as I detest Jerry Adams, you know, I think he's a, f a fucking rattlesnake, like, you know, and it came out in the play, like, and then the BBC gripped onto it, the next thing, all the newspapers just started all going around the whole of Ireland, you know, and there was a lot of trouble going on here with so-called dissidents, I don't call them dissidents, I just call them Irish men, Irish women who want to fight, you know, it's up to them, so I've given up fighting, you know, I've done what I've done, you know, and I'm not going to condemn anybody who wants to fight, you know. But they were trying to put me under pressure to condemn Republicans who were continuing to struggle, continue to fight. And I said, I would never condemn them, you know. So I got a lot of abuse about it, you know. And there's a sort of a, it's almost like an invisible censorship now against my books. You know, newspapers won't review them. Magazines won't touch them, you know. If my publisher said, if you just keep your mouth shut, doors would open. But I am who I am, you know. I'm never going to change. But when I go to France, I get bestsellers. Get Germans, everybody don't give a shit about this country anymore, you know. This is what they've done, they've turned their back on me, you know, because they don't like what I write. Is that hard for you? It was for a couple of years, especially when I go to different countries and I see the praise and all I'm getting and getting awards. I got so many literary awards, you know, and I'm thinking, why is my own country, you know, not giving me the praise, you know, or anything? It's just a simple reason is I got turned my back on the Good Friday Agreement. I'm a strong advocate against it. I think it was a sellout by Jerry Adams and Sinn Féin. And because of that, I've been blackballed, blackmailed, blacklisted, censored, everything. But that's the way it is, you know. I'll take it on the chin. How do you deal with that now? How do I deal with it? Yeah. Well, I, I read another one and I, I, I know it's going to go to France, it's going to go to Germany, it's going to get praised for it. You know, eventually going, when this movie, there's going to be a movie coming out about my life. It's going to sicken them, you know, because they're going to have to show it in movie houses. They can't censor it blatantly. You know, because I'm going to start writing the, the British press and say, well, these are always complaining about all these countries oppressing writers, you know. These are a bunch of hypocrites. I've been oppressed here for the last 12 years. My books have all been censored. There's not a peep out of any of you know. A lot of hypocrisy among writers, you know. I heard Mel Gibson might be playing your part. Uh, Mel Gibson, oh, don't, don't mention him. He's a fucking mad, mad man. <laughs> How? It's just, it's, it's hard to explain, you know. It's just the, the shit that he's done with his fucking film, this studio and all, you know. And he's, we've had the top writer writing, it's beautiful. But he wanted himself to, see when the book first came out, we're Warner Bros. He, he, he bought the, he wanted to buy the rights off Warner Bros. He wanted to act it. He wanted to direct it as, you know, usual stuff. It's fuck I thought was brilliant at the time. Of course, I, I don't care anymore about that sort of shit. But at that time, you know, 20 years ago, like, but he's just fucking uncontrollable. I have a lot of respect for him, some of the movies he's made, you know, but he's just a fucking real military. He done it, I think he'd done the same with Braveheart, he directed it, produced it, and oh, played the own part. It's just, 
Is he a nutcase? Yeah. He's a real lunatic. But he was not bang on the booze. Was he not an alcoholic at one point? I don't know about that. Then he changed his life. Yeah, I don't know. I think he got involved with an extreme Catholic organization. Uh, Curtis Dare or something. It's one of these fucking really dodgy sort of a Catholic extreme right wing Catholic church from the Jesuits. And I think he's involved in something like that there, you know. That's why his outbreaks about the Jews and all, like he's been made a lot of anti Semitic remarks and all, like, you know, that's where it stems from, you know. Yeah. I don't have time for that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Did he not do the film? Christ of Christ, Christ, Christ. The Passion of Christ. Yeah. 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 Then, like, you know, yeah. They changed. Yeah. This, yeah. But uh, like, I just think he's a fucking real you know. Who would you like to play the part? Benny Hill. <laughs> do you probably don't even know Benny Hill? Yeah, yeah, the, com you? the comedian. Yeah, he's dead yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what people say. I don't think I'm going to go big actor and all. And I said, Benny yeah. Hill, that's the type of life I've had, you know? Just a yeah. bad, crazy act. Mm -hmm. Like, listen, I don't care anymore, but 20 years ago, I occurred, you know, people would ask you, who do you want? Who do you want? Sean Penn, you know? See, no, I don't care. Lost all interest, you know? Yeah, there's been some great Irish films, all that, in the name yeah. of the father. And you've yeah. got Daniel Day Lewis, who's a, a mad actor. Oh, uh, Brendan It's unbelievable One achievements, which he's done. I actually watched Gangs of New York last yeah. week, man. And it's about the fourth time I've seen it. Unbelievable film, unbelievable actors in that. Like. So, where do you go from here, Sam? Like, you seem to have kind of done it all. You seem to have lived a mad, crazy, beautiful, successful life. But yeah, I don't know if it's successful, like, but you know, is it you've got. Yeah, don't get discredit yourself, man. You've got boys selling books. You're still here to tell the tale. Like, yeah. You fought for something you believed yeah, in. You never I gave up. So, like, you know? It's an unbelievable yeah. achievement. But where do you go from here, Sam? Well, I'm still writing. I'm writing a screenplay right now. I'm hoping that there will get me in the movie. You know, I think I've, I've done everything. I've wrote poetry. I've done everything can do with a pen. You know, I've always never thought I could do anything, you know. So that's been my pride and joy, you know, at the moment, you know. So that's about it. I just take each day now as it comes. I enjoy life. I've got my kids. i got a granddaughter now. And I, you know, I'm so happy. You know, I'm sitting there at times, me and her talking. She's only like one, you know, and I've got her at the keyboard and she's letting on to be writing and all. Like, you know, I post on Facebook. She's writing a new card cane book. That's my Belfast detective, you know, like. So I have great times now. And I'm just loving life. What do you think now, talking about your life and bringing up a lot of emotions? Because there's a couple of times you've got emotional and rightly so. Yeah. But does it make you think fuck me like I, ha I have lived a mad life yeah like I just think about my friends who died very young you know I lost a lot of friends very young didn't even make it to their 20 all died in their teens you know and things like that stay with you forever I think about them every day you know and I think why me am I going to go to a real bad place when I die you know that's why I'm getting all this good stuff like you know what I mean like so I don't really know it's strange it's a strange life was that a dark time in your life when was the darkest time in your life do you think Sam I think in the the hate box, because it was never ending, it never stopped, and it got so bad you thought you were dead. It may be as hell, you know. I know it sounds a wee bit crazy, but it was just hard to believe it could go on and human beings could just do that every day. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it to an animal, you know. Couldn't do it. Yet they done it with joy in their fucking heads, you know, and laughing. It was unbelievable, you know. I just worry, strangely enough, you know, one of them. We knew, and he, he was called a human wart, and we just knew he was a bad, bad chap. And not too long ago, he was charged with being a pedophile, abusing his daughters and, and nephews. And we sort of way knew he you know? And that's what makes me think, are these people who were able to do this? Because I couldn't fucking do that. I couldn't, see if I got a, a, a loyalist prisoner or no? Couldn't do it. No fucking way, I might hold him captive. But there's no way you could fucking torture him and then come in the next day and torture him. Couldn't do it. Would never do it. I'd go mental, even thinking about doing it. These guys did it gladly for years, you know? So I thought that's the, the problem. See, if they came and asked for forgiveness, it would mean a lot to me. I think we got a lot of poison in my system, but they've never done that, you know? I mean, the British government have apologized, Tony Blair's apologized, you know, the British soldiers have apologized, but these fucking guys have still never ever apologized for what they've done. It's, it's fucking war crimes, like, they got away with it. You've changed your life now, but what happens if you ever seen one of these men who... Oh, well, I have seen them. How was that feeling? Just, there was a thought, you're going to do something stupid here and go back to jail for a scumbag like that. But you look at them, you let them know you they shit themselves, you know, because I see in the street and they've shit themselves. Because I thought, I didn't think you'd be in this here. You know, they've got to come within communities. They can't hide in their houses. They've got to come out sometime, you know. And, and lots of area men see them. Don't do anything, because there's no war against them anymore. But I've seen a couple of them, you know. Stirred them out. When's the best time of your life, Sam? Best time of life was having my kids born, babies. It's funny, they were all born in the place 
role that Titanic survivors came to when the Titanic sunk in New York. You know, it was just one of them ironic things. You know what I mean? Like, that's where we're all born. Like, and when they were born, it changed me. I know I went and done the fucking brinks and said it changed <laughs> me. But I think it matured me as a father, you know. And maybe at the back of my head, I said, like, I want them to have a great life. I want them to go to the best schools. I want them to have a life that don't struggle, you know what I mean? But it was wrong to think like that because my kids end up having fucking good jobs, do their own education. But at the time, my head wasn't, you know what I mean? Maybe I'm just making excuses for doing the brinks, you know. I don't know. But I know I, I changed when I became a father, like, you know. Yeah, but at the end of the day, no, no, nobody got harmed in the brinks. Do you know what I mean? It's not as if no, no, well, was, which is a main no, thing. No, that was a thing. Yes, it's wrong, nobody, but yeah. nobody, nobody oh, no. died. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you question, like, looking back at that? I ask people, like, would you change anything? People say, like, hindsight's a great thing, and I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't be the person I am. But would you change anything that you've done back in the yeah. past? I would never do a brinks. <laughs> no, really. yeah, why? And not because got, it's never done it. I destroyed yeah. so many people's lives. I didn't realize the consequences of it, far reaching. The people who looked up to me suddenly were shocked at what I'd done a criminal act. And the people who were dead, who my friends were dead, political prisoners, you know, shame I brought on them. Can't do it, can't redo really it, you know, that's it. Mm -hmm. you, know, I to, you know, I think I've suffered enough for it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, has I beat myself up all the time about it, but after a while you beat yourself up so much, there's no more blood left, you know? Do you do that a lot, Sam? All the time, yeah. But to it, you know. And going forward for the future, like hopefully we get a full amount. You're going to write more books. Always, I'll die writing. I'll mm -hmm. die with typing stuff. You know what I mean? I just love words. I've always loved words as a little kid. You know what I mean? Put that back to my love of comic books, American comic books. I started my love of writing. You know, and love of reading. You know, I love words. I just love how it's formed. You know, I think I've never had. So if I went back into Long Cash again, I took books because I never had books. Weren't like books. Weren't like nothing. If I had to go without days without a book, I just couldn't. I don't know what would happen, you know. Yeah, but listening to your story, like, it's an unbelievable story that like, what you've went through and like, what you're achieving. Like, like I say, man, you should be proud of what you've came through to then writing best selling books and being a family man. And you know, right from wrong, but being in Ireland and involved in the troubles in Northern Ireland, that like, that was just the way it is back then. Like, you're going to fight for someone, and it's yeah, just. Um, exactly. It's just the way it is. And like I say, I've spoke to people both sides and I'm only a man from Scotland who loves to interview people. I just love to know how they get involved, why they get involved, how they feel now and get a better understanding of it. Like people might read in the papers and the news, but we all know that they're all full of shit anyway. They, can, they, they can push their own narratives yeah. to what people want to believe and pe people actually believe what they read. But when you actually get a better understanding of why you started it and losing friends, getting shot six times and family members and friends getting blown up and both sides, like you can understand yeah, no, why course, no, big time. everything Listen, erupted. My bro and my son-in-law is unionist, you know, I've got lots of pro loyalist Protestant friends and all, I don't give a shit about persons all as you know, but at the same time I had to respect each other, treat each other equal. And how was that for the first time to speak to a, a loyalist to well, understand I, what they went through? I always through, had the loyalist done? blood in me because of mm -hmm. my grandfather, so I used to stay with my aunts in Tigers Bay which is a staunch Loyalist area in Belfast, you know. So I always had that from both sides. And one thing that media couldn't get it when I used to say about bad things that happened in Tigers Bay when I was a Catholic kid there, they couldn't turn and go, How would you know anything about that? You were never in Tigers Bay. You see, now they don't like it because I live both sides, you know. And I read, I say the way it was, you know, because they don't like it because you're seeing from both sides, you know what I mean? As I say, there's scumbags on both sides and there's great people on both sides, you know. What would you have done if you were in, in charge of the whole thing in Northern Ireland? Like, what would you do to then make it a better place? What do you think was the right thing to do to calm it down and make people happier? It's, it's a question, well, it's, you're not going to get that for a long time because unionists are terrified that their privilege has been taken away from them. But why, why should you have a privilege over me? Why should you be treated differently? Why should I be a second-class citizen? Why should a black person in South Africa be a second-class citizen to a white person? You know? That's what it all comes down to, treating people with respect and equality. You can't have justice, you can't have peace without justice, you know? And you always got to remember equality. Why would you not want to treat a person equal? Why do you think you're superior to them, you know? I've never thought that. And I'll tell you what, I would go to war for unions if there ever was a union and they were treated like shit. I think that's the thing a union fear, that we will treat them the way they treated us. And I would be one of the first to go and fight for them and fight against anybody. You try to put a price on them. For anybody watching, Sam, where can they get your website, books? Get on www.millercrime.com and you get the books anywhere. 
Thank you very much. What about like, social media or anything? Are you I'm on that Facebook. Stuff? If anybody just tap in some, Molly, you'll see me there. A big, ugly face waiting, <laughs> waiting for you. And Twitter and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff, you know. You seem to have battled a lot of mental health as well through the years, Sam. Like, for anybody watching that's maybe struggling themselves, what advice would you have for them? Don't do what I do. Go and find help. There's somebody who can help you. Sam, for coming on today, James, thank you for coming all the way from... Yeah. Glorious Glasgow, <laughs> you know. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, but for coming on today and telling me your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you. You're a great man, Sam. I look forward to seeing what you do for the future, brother, and look forward to seeing your film. Thank you, James. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you, pal.